I ordered both colors. We smoked a hookah for like two hours after everybody left. It was Some dude walked by and Jim was like, good. oh, okay. Look, I'm like, hot. I'm like, <laughs> sir, is that the jumbo petite? <laughs> One of my favorite things is smoking hookah in the U.S. If you smoke hookah in the Middle East, it'll fuck you up. Yes, it will. Really? What's, What's the, the difference in hookah? Right? They put tobacco in it. Oh, yeah. 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 What's in it here? Just vapor. Just, yeah, it's just vapor. flavor. Oh, really? Yeah. yeah. That's why it doesn't feel like. No. It'll it'll tear up your throat. It'll give you a little bit of a head high, but like you do that stuff in the Middle East, and like here you could smoke coca all night. In the Middle East, you yeah. get you do like one, and you're whoo, you're like mm. gone. Really? Yeah. That's they stay up all night doing it. That's the kind of hookah I want to smoke. I'm you, telling you. If, if just take it easy when you do it. <laughs> yeah. And don't be sitting Go with hookah anybody. Slow. Don't yeah. Sit with a Jordanian. Don't sit with an Emirati or a Saudi. Why? Did, what, what's up with Because like, a, a Jordanian's the fun. The Emiratis and the Saudis are just gonna like they're just gonna. S- pull as much information out of you as possible because they they do everything very really hard. yeah andy i gotta come clean i gotta start the podcast with this me and julian were having like a we had like a 30 40 minute debate last night whether or not you uh murdered people overseas it's i'm like not i go right i go word. i don't think he's i, I can't murder. see andy slaying i, I don't think yeah. he's a he's a killer I mean, maybe. <laughs> Jim said, no, where you're going. Yeah. There's no doubt. There's no doubt. I'm in my like, mind. I'm like, well, this is what this is what my thought was. I'm like, it's got to be compartmentalized. Andy's got to be the guy that sets people up and and can like has the meetings, tricks everybody, and there's got to be another guy that slips in somebody's window at night and and fucking slits their throat. I don't. It's, we don't call it tricking. I don't see. We Andy. don't call it murder. <laughs> and he also. <laughs> And he's the like, thing, let me call. Andy's me call. the kind of guy, slit your throat, but then he helps your head down to the ground. So, <laughs> so that you can have an open casket. Thank you. I'm serious. You and I There's think guys alike. like that. Yeah. There's also. Me, I don't there's care. There's also post the casket. When you let the head drop. So you got to you gotta put Absolutely. the head down. Absolutely. So you do it politely. It's, it's intimate. Yeah. You'll never have an open casket. There's intimate with me. killers and there's not <laughs> intimate <laughs> killers. So That's I always right. thought CIA people, they would kill you by either poisoning you. Or like they they had this way of inducing heart attacks, making people have heart attacks. Poison's way too high risk. Well, poison the wrong person might take it. We or, tried to poison what's his name Castro, right? I mean, I think yeah. we've, we've tried to poison more people than we've successfully oh, poisoned. Oh, okay, yeah, agreed. Yeah. What are some of the best ways that they pull off nondescript kills? Nondescript. Yeah, meaning like people. What is the really what is the preferred way of preferred way of murder? Car not murder. What, what do you call murder? Car accidents. Car accident. Drowning. Drowning. Assassinations. Okay. So, uh, and I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to say that there's really very little value in a in a nondescript killing. Yes. The value comes from a high profile. One hundred percent. Because now mm. you get you get the influence impact. So deliver the message. Correct. You want to deliver a crystal clear message. You mm. use a non-explosive missile. You use uh, uh, like the if you've heard of uh, switchblade missiles, not the drones, right? The drones are something different, but there's a, a missile that launches and when right before it hits its target, it has blades that come out the sides. So now you mm. can hit one target with blades out both sides that basically turn the body into an explosive. And then everybody mm. else in the car is now covered in the guts and the brains and the body That'll parts. That'll do. That'll do. Because now great. you get the kill and you send a message. Yep. That's 100%. what's really bad. That's how wow. we handle it. You still yeah. think he's innocent as fuck? It's not an intimate kill. <laughs> it's not yeah. an intimate it's kill. It's not. You're not, on, you're not eye to eye. Yeah. You'll see his eyes later. It'll be on oh the other guy. Oh, my God. But <laughs> You've got an eye on this guy yeah. watching. Yep. And then you see him all break, and you see them kind of wiping it off the yep. shirt, and they're freaking out. And you're like, oh, it's a win. It's a, it win. a win for America today, guys. Spoken Agreed. like a man with experience. Wow. Yeah, you give yourself That's incredible. Room. We've just read about it. Andy and I. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> I saw it in a movie once. Yeah, exactly. I, I don't know why I haven't seen that in a movie. That's such a badass thing. I don't. The only thing I can think of is it's just too, it's too grotesque. For Gory. Yeah. yeah. What, what? It's probably silent too, right? Or fairly silent. It's like a thud. Like, a thud? like a, the car still yeah. runs. It goes like through the windshield or through the side windows or through the back window. It doesn't hurt the engine block. It just mm. hits the person. Person blows up. Right. I mean, it's moving 600, 700 miles an hour when it yeah. hits. But well, it doesn't like break the car. It just puts a giant hole in the car and everybody else can get out and walk. What about know? some old school like car bombings? They still doing a lot of that? Not we don't do that kind of stuff. No. It's not it's I told you. The profile's too high risk, guys. You get it. When you think about what we do overseas, I mean, this guy's nodding his head. Like we've got you've got a Senate to account for, a congressional mm. staff, you know, your know, congressional house you gotta account for, you got the executive you have to account for. So everything is heavily bureaucratized so 
with the stuff that we need to do, we need it to be discreet to everyone except the target audience. So like when mm -hmm. you blow up a terrorist, you want it to be the terrorist cell knows what happened, but pretty much nobody else does. Mm -hmm. That's how we want to operate. That's exactly right. Even Car bombs and motorcycle bombs, that's from Assad. So what What about that guy? Wow. What was the dude, like Putin's chief advisor uh, or something? Oh, dude who was poisoned? No, or no. I know what you're thinking of. I'm, I'm talking about a recent one, though. Like Putin's chief advisor... The daughter's like a media member and the guy got like blown up in his car a few oh, months yeah, ago. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. They were saying, I, I think the word was like, oh, Ukraine had to do that. So I guess that would make sense based on what you're saying. That wouldn't have been something we would have looked at. Right. That's MI6, CIA. Mm. Uh, yeah, there were even even SVR, right? They try to stay very discreet unless even when they poison people, they, they do it discreetly. It just hits the headlines when somebody finds a poisoned body. I cut you off, Jim. I'm sorry. No, no, no. I was I was just thinking about um another another method, but um it doesn't make sense in this context. I'm thinking more of interrogation. Have you seen the videos of killing somebody? The after <laughs> <laughs> I think uh, I think if it relates to killing, then it's related to the topic. Collarbone. Yeah. Okay. Have you seen the videos of uh, the like some of the attempt attempted assassinations on Putin? Like the, there's one specific. I think it's still no. on YouTube where the car tries to drive across the median, across the highway, and tries to get like hit Putin's car. But I guess so. Somebody was driving Putin's vehicle. I think it was his mm -hmm. limo or something like that. But he wasn't in it, and a car was driving down the other side of the highway in Russia. Going like 120, no, comes all the way across the median and it T-bones the car and kills the driver. Do we have that on video? Yeah, see if you can find that on YouTube. It's definitely on video. I've seen it on YouTube before. And Putin's like, no get me. I'm not there. <laughs> kind of yeah. like kind of like the Patton. Pat, same thing happened to Patton, right? I mean, yeah. back in the day. Oh, yeah. What? yeah. That's over. way back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Yep. Yep. He eventually succumbed to the injuries, but yep. didn't kill him on the spot. Oh, my God. So, did we ever find himself. out who did yeah. that? No. No one found out who did that? Did no, they? no. Nope, never. Uh, well, they they said he survived, right? I mean, I think they they said he survived for a while, um, and then they said he lived longer, like that he wasn't dead because he's I mean, Patton. Yeah, yeah exactly. You don't, yeah, you don't pitch invading China. No, and then go out quietly in a Exa car accident. Exactly that's right. right. Yeah, that's exactly right. That's right. Yeah, George C. Scott played a nice role there too. So, it, what, what, what's the latest in Ukraine though? That's really that's that's what we wanted to to get to right away because it seems like it's been a Almost a stalemate. I, I, that's the that's not the best way to describe it, but it, it feels minus the blow up of the pipeline a few months ago. That was seemed just to be some media political well, play he, at the end of the day. It feels like a total nothing burger for the last three four months. I mean, he's on the, he's on the run. He's got a tail between the legs. I worry. I mean, I don't know how you feel about it, Andy, but I worry about things. You know, I yeah. worry this guy's a nut. He's a narcissist. Yeah. He's as much as a narcissist as the other orange haired dude. That's Going to make an announcement on Tuesday. Really, oh, yeah. Really screw the country. But in two days. Yeah, unbelievable. In the middle of this fight, um, you know, obviously Herschel Walker should take him out. But, <laughs> my, you know, my thought, I worry about the fact that he's got the capability to do some crazy things and he's feeling like he needs to do some crazy things, right? So who knows? I just don't know. Yeah, so it, it's funny because even in hearing your, your comment right there, Julian, like I cringe because you can see you can see the Western narrative playing out. Mm. It's not a stalemate. It's not a stalemate when there's still thousands of people dying yeah. every week. You know what I mean? There's there's twenty four thousand rounds a week being launched in terms of artillery from the Russian side. There's oh four to God. six thousand rounds of artillery being launched a week from the Ukrainian side. Like it's not. It's not a stalemate. What about the progress, this, though? This is, this is what protracted war looks like, right? Mm -hmm. This is right out of the Army War College. A million percent. You've got anybody out there who's trying to say that Russia is winning right now, would you consider it, or anybody who's trying to say Ukraine is winning, if somebody else owns 20% of your house, you're not winning. Are mm. you fighting back? Yeah, and Ukraine is fighting back. They're, they have surprised the world over and over again. They shocked the world by with a resistance in the first two weeks. Mm -hmm. They shocked the world with a counterattack. They shocked the world with what's going on in Kherson right now. Like this is this is what protracted war looks like. There's battlefield wins, there's battlefield losses. And especially when you're talking about Ukraine versus Russia, both of them were trained in the same school of combat, the Russian Soviet school of combat, which is all about disinformation, misinformation, and trying to attack what nobody sees. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. That so we never really know what's going to happen next. Mm -hmm. 
in this conflict. We can try to make assessments, we can try to make predictions, but we should all expect that predictions are going to be wrong and assessments really should be weighted out with their probabilities, right? So what what's what's coming? You know, it's the winter is coming. Mm. Russia still controls massive portions of Ukraine. Has Russia pulled back some of their advance? They've they've definitely pulled back. They've dug in. It, I mean, I've had folks who've come back from Ukraine saying it looks more like World War One out there. It's mm. trench warfare. Trenched up artillery pieces. Only now there's side artillery. Yeah, I mean the the, the rounds fired right twenty four thousand a week. What what most people don't understand is the shock effect. Even if there's no no killing with regards to these explosions or these rounds, the shock effect is so severe that it's almost impossible. You, you see the old World War One and World War Two videos of, you know, what's now classified as PTS or classified as like a closed head injury, um, a traumatic brain injury, those kinds mm-hmm. of things. That's from the shock effect. That's from the fact mm-hmm. that you're continuously hearing and getting hit on top of sites and areas, right? The other part of it is um, exploding rounds. These things explode like 20 yards above your oh, head. Yeah. Oh, fuck. And they and rain then down. just rip you, you know? So that's, though, even if you survive that, you don't survive that. So I think that's kind of the situation that's in. They continue to just fire these particular artillery and drone rounds, and they're making, they're making progress in that fashion. There's no more, no more traditional combat. There's no more, hey, mm. hand-to-hand. There's no more of that stuff really going on. When but, I was saying stalemate, by the way, because yeah. I, I, that was a bad word to use, because I didn't mean like, oh, there's no fighting no going on. Seems like nothing. No movement. What I meant was, have the lines changed? Like you're, it's a good point. Russia is in twenty percent of the house, but like, have we seen Russia move to like forty percent, or seen Ukraine push them back five? The That's strategic, more what I'm the strategic, the strategic field of battle in Ukraine is the south. It's the land bridge to mm-hmm. Odessa and Moldova. Right. It has never changed. If you even if you look at the counterattack that started in August on August 29th, where did that counterattack make the most progress? In the north, mm-hmm. right? The counterattack was yeah. brilliantly executed, and Zelensky even said himself that the reason they launched a counterattack in the north was because they knew they were about to lose ongoing support from NATO in the west. They needed to show battlefield victories in order to continue receiving support mm. from the west. He knew it. He knew it, and he publicly announced it. And then he said, that's why we launched a counterattack. And the they launched a counterattack in the north and the south. The south barely moved. The north had massive gains. So they redirected all of their resources to the north. Why were they so successful in the north? Because for the preceding two months, uh, Russia had been moving all of their forces to the south because they know the strategic value of Ukraine is to close off the southern end. If they need to call in help from Belarus, they will. And guess what they've been doing? Mobilizing troops mm. in Belarus. So they weren't worried strategically about the north. They've always been focused on the South, which is why you've seen what you've seen in the South. And it's also part of the reason why what's happening in Harrison City right now is so relevant, because that is truly a strategic battle. All the stuff that happened up North was much less strategic. It wasn't mm. worth launching a tactical nuke because they came in, you know, up North and, mm. and invaded even after they annexed that location. It's not worth it strategically mm. to piss off NATO and piss off the West with nuclear weapons. This is exactly what Jim's talking about. You've got a loose cannon an authoritarian leader who can make basically any call he wants to make, but then he's also working within the confines of his own system where he knows, like we talked about, Julian, he may make a call and the field officers don't obey. And that's yeah. that's part of the calculated risk he has to he has to think through, right? So he changes battlefield commanders, battlefield commanders change their strategy, but the strategic goal has not changed. And winter is coming, 40% of the Ukrainian electrical grid is broken, we just really? had, you haven't heard this? No. This, again, straight out of American military war college, you attack the electrical grid and you let winter do the fighting for you. Mm-hmm. There's rolling blackouts in Ukraine right now. Is that There's shelling in attacks? Ukraine right now. No, it's, it's missiles hitting just electrical <clears throat> relay stations. Like they can't recreate that power. Tier one stuff, man. That's yeah. what happens out of the box. Wow. Why? I mean, hasn't... Um, Putin come to the table and try to come up with a deal. Haven't haven't Ukraine and Putin like been close to deals multiple times? They've never been close to landing a deal, right? And it's because this is super important too. Uh, after Ukraine, after the Ukrainian electrical grid started getting attacked, Zelensky came out and said they will not negotiate peace with Russia until certain criteria are met. And the criteria were 
completely unrealistic criteria. He wanted the original boundaries redrawn from like 1997, (laughs) a full withdrawal of Russian troops. Like it was an insane thing to ask for. You got to start high. Prince. Yeah. So uh, based on principle, right? Western principles, Mm -hmm. we think, oh no, that's reasonable. Just you, you invaded us. You've got to get out. The problem is when you're going to a negotiating table, you can't ever make it a full loss for the other person. Yes. Right. Yeah. How's he going to rationalize to his own people all the death, all the destruction, all the loss? He can't. Right. That's not a realistic negotiating yes. position. Right. What Russia has been doing is taking territory and stopping and opening the door for communication. It's been Zelensky for the last three or four months that has been unrealistic. And that's why you saw last week the United States step in, tap Zelensky on the shoulder and say, mm. you need to show a little more flexibility to negotiate. So what that means in clear terms is who that, the, U- that the United States? Yeah, really? but who said that? Wait that, a the second. The Biden administration said that. But did you hear about the Progressive Caucus and and the letter they sent to Biden that then got like murked? I so I don't know. That so they I have not they heard sent of. they sent. There's 30 members of the Progressive Caucus in Congress. Rashida Tlaib's on it. That guy Jamie Raskin's on it. And they sent a letter to Biden that they allegedly had drafted like a month or something ago. This is a couple weeks ago now. And it, I read it, it's, you can find it online right now. It laid out very nicely that like, Hey, we've been happy to send aid to Ukraine. Obviously we support their cause, everything like that. But there is some intelligence that suggests that there could be a possibility of having peace on the table. And that is something that for not just the good of Ukraine to get them a W, maybe not like a full W, maybe not like Russia doesn't cease to exist, but to get them a little W and also create peace along the border, peace for the world take down this whole nuclear potential and all that. Let's take a look at this. Letter comes out. Next day, out of nowhere, oh no, some staff leaked that. We didn't really mean to send that, which is total bullshit. Somebody like you went and tapped them on the shoulder and said, you're not going to fucking put this out. And now we have you saying that like Biden's approach in Ukraine and saying, oh, you need to talk about peace. It's, 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 it's not unknown right now. It's fairly, co- it's, it's fairly well covered right now. That, uh, that, and not only is it, encouraged but Zelensky has come out and publicly said that he is willing to mm. he's open to negotiation he is tr- he is changing the foundational requirements for negotiation right he's made that a public statement now i am open to negotiation <laughs> exactly nobody talks like that but my, is- <laughs> my wife's going on oprah and we'll we'll square this up but <laughs> the other the other thing that i think that you have to think about too is rank and file soldier right mm-hmm. so now you have um russian soldiers who are actually commiserating with and aligning themselves with the Ukrainians. Yeah. yeah. Right. So the, we heard those stories right out of the box out uh, taking, you know, making sure the vehicles don't run, don't want to go in. Why are we here? We're being called up to do things we don't believe in. You saw, you know, Putin sitting at the end of one table, everybody else sitting at the end, the other end, eating alone, you know, all those things, but rank mm-hmm. and file is important, you know, so it's hearts and minds kind of stuff. That's, that's kind of what I did in the military, the hearts and minds piece. Let's see where they're at. Let's see if we can bring this together and find a common cause you know, to go forward. I mean, it's a civil war, right? So, I mean, it's the same people that were living together 25 yep. years ago, yep. um, you know, and now they have to, they're fighting each other and they're trying to figure out a way to reduce the death, reduce the casualties, reduce the state of mind. And I think that's important. That's something that's kind of lost in the negotiations piece. And who knows who's talking about that? I know we're, we're not talking about it. I can guarantee um, what know, with Millie still there. I mean, what do you think chance. about Biden just going and meeting with Putin face to face. Do you think that would happen? The the reason that can't happen is because technically this isn't supposed to be a war between the United States and Russia. Yep. What's happening is that every time the United States gets in, if you remember back in like March, uh, French President Macron came out and said and said that Putin, uh, that Biden needs to stop commenting on the conflict. It was shortly after Biden was in Poland and said, for the love of God, oh, nobody yeah. should let this guy <laughs> yep. reign. Just take yep. him out. Because <laughs> yep. what was happening is, is Biden's like very overt implications of how the United States stood to benefit from this conflict was throwing off NATO's goals. And since then, you saw the French president come in and say Biden back down. You've seen the German chancellor step up and say, we need to fi- we need to create a NATO without the United States military being Mm. the biggest force, which is why Germany is doubling down on building their army Mm. because they're like, we need to be the largest army in Europe so that we can drive NATO. Because right now the United States drives NATO. And if you look at NATO's charter, guess who can join NATO? European states. Yes, it's called the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. The only North Atlantic countries that are allowed into 
that are, that are not European are Canada and the United States. Yes. Yeah. Right? <laughs> Even the charter itself says we're open to new people if they're European. So it makes no sense that Europe is basically operating at the behest of whatever the United States chooses to do. Yeah, I've, we were finding this article because yep. you just mentioned this. This is from two days ago in the Kiev Post, so straight out of Ukraine, yep. where the headline is Zelensky says open to talks with Russia, and the article says exactly what you think. It so does. I understand. I understand the the Twitter armchair analysts out there who basically want to shit on everybody all the time. I get shit on by them too, right? Oh yeah, yeah. You oh, know. <laughs> Zelensky's changing this or changing that or whatever it's going to be. Right? Five days ago he said this, and now he's saying that. That's that is that's the nature of conflict. Yeah. If you're not a professional soldier, if you're not a professional public servant, you don't understand policy changes, priorities shift. That's just how it works. Same thing's happening on the Russia side. So is it a W to, your, to use your terminology, right? And I talked about this with Lex when we were on, when Lex and I were on uh, the Lex Freeman podcast. A W, a win, doesn't look the way people think it's going to look, mm. right? Your typical uninformed person thinks that a win is going to look like Russia raises their hands and gives up and leaves Ukraine alone. A win is most likely going to look like Russia says, we'll stop here. Yeah. And Ukraine says, we'll accept that. And maybe there's a ceasefire and they've still lost 20% of their territory. And what does mm. that mean for the world? If Russia now has 20% of Ukraine, new Ukraine, new 80% of Ukraine. What, does it, Ukraine mean, what does it mean for the world if Russia has 100% of Ukraine? Yeah. What did it mean for the world on February 23rd before Russia ever invaded Ukraine? It means nothing to the world. Ukraine Truly. is not a strategic objective truly for anybody. Yeah. Nobody Why do you cares. say that? This this is a Putin. This is a narcissism one on one, man. This Let me get what I think is mine. Yep. I'm crazy. I'm out of my mind. We we saw we seen it in our on Pennsylvania area Avenue two or three years ago. It's the same shit. So what? You know, why are we pumping hundred? If that's the case, obviously, like there's a humanitarian crisis there. We're, so I see we're the that, leaders but... of the free world, right? So that's Julian, what it comes down to. Julian, ask yourself the hard question, right? You're mm. asking the hard question right now. Yeah. What's the point? What's the point? Why is the United States involved in this? It has nothing to do with Ukraine's independence or sovereignty helping the United States. Do we own them? Is that part of it? Client state over there? Even if you did, like, what do you own? You own a poverty stricken country that's exactly. on the verge of a failing democracy. That was before it was invaded. You want to know what you get out of this conflict? The United States gets to practice logistical shipments of large scale weapons and movements across the world in time for a real battle. You want to know what the United States gets out of it? They get to burn through old surplus weaponry and test experimental weaponry exactly. on an active battlefield. Why is that beneficial to the United States? Because our real threat is 7,000 miles away. Yep. And if we don't get a chance to practice pro a, a protracted war a halfway across the globe, then we're going to get caught with our pants down when China invades Taiwan. Because yep. guess how far away China is from Taiwan? Only 80 miles further than Russia was from Ukraine. Well, according to one China Danny here, Taiwan's <laughs> a part of China. Oh. That's not one China Danny. <laughs> That's one China Biden, too. And, I'm and, sure. yeah, we, Sleepy, Sleepy Joe's got a big meeting on Tuesday. This will all go yep. away. Don't, don't, don't worry. <laughs> don't fret. He's got it under control. Isn't China already shooting fucking missiles towards Taiwan? Absolutely. Yeah. That's they're showing they're showing what their capability is. What happened a few weeks ago with maybe a month ago now? I think it, I think it's been a while. But the there was the Communist Party meeting in China and you had I forget the fucking guy's Hu name. Jintao, and all, yeah, that Xi dude. Jinping, yeah. He was like this old dude sitting next to Xi Jinping. <laughs> and then like security came in and like started yanking his ass out of the chair. <laughs> and Xi's just sitting. That was like the ultimate like, yeah, sorry, fam. Like. Don't know what's going on. His, like, what happened there? <laughs> historians and politicians, I'm sorry, historians and political scientists around the world cringe when Julian talks about world international. <laughs> <laughs> this fucking Good. old guy sitting there. And <laughs> this guy gets ripped up. It's on TikTok. And he turns around. <laughs> Somewhere there's a he puts somewhere, a new school spin on he it. He does. Yeah. Somewhere there. I've does. never heard anybody who knows more about the CIA and the FBI and the U.S. government than Julian. I, I swear to God, a there's a there's a there's a Harvard professor somewhere sitting there like I made a career out of studying <laughs> political science <laughs> so that this guy could call this Hu Jintao ima some old guy. Ima imagine David Satter <laughs> sitting across from me, fifty years like Financial Times, like Moscow correspondent. I'm oh. saying shit like this. He's like, oh. Yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. <laughs> but anyway, so yeah. Jim, what 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 happened, there? Jim? I'm doing a bunch of talks. So, so if you, if you I'm, I'm jumping in, this, man. I'm, I'm listening. Okay, I'm, I'm just, learning. I don't want to stop. I'm listening. All of you, and learning. Man. You know me. It's just all about 
Breaking we have to all figure this out. We've never done four like. There's mics never before. been. Has there ever been a podcast with FBI and CIA at the same table? Right before 9 11. I'm only kidding. <laughs> um, it didn't happen. It did not happen. It did not happen. This is good. We're, we're actually setting the mark here. We're bringing. High, high water mark right here, boys. That's going to get clipped. One <laughs> step at a time. Yeah. One oh step at a time. Oh, God. That's going to be in documentaries oh, 10 years boy. from now. Yeah, it is. Well, Lord. But no, in all honesty, I do think this is a pretty cool pairing. Yeah, it's like, really cool. Yeah. You, this is something that probably, I'm honestly, it could probably never happen if we were active CIA, active DOD, or active no. FBI. Because there would be so much bureaucracy to get through. Somebody would uh, say no, it would be too high risk. The editing would be outrageous. The ownership rights would be outrageous. I mean, publicly, you guys aren't active, but you know, privately. Yeah, according to the comments, yeah. you guys well, are you guys are both still active. Did you get a description still. of the old guy that get ripped out of the chair? That might have been me. No, I'm gonna kill. No, 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 he was he was Asian. Who was the guy that got Who Chinese was the guy, guy that got ripped out of the chair? So that his name was Hu Jintao. So who can we find that? Yeah, what you what you saw? You speak Chinese too, so you were my, definitely my listening. Ch to my that. Chinese is rusty. If you can imagine, like like cobwebs in an attic kind of thing, <laughs> that's what my Chinese. You haven't been like. keeping up. How long did it take you to learn Chinese? Uh, technically, it took me four years Isn't it to, called Mandarin? to speak at a fifth grade level. Okay. So, yeah, the military taught me for a long time, and it never got very good. Where were you, Monterey? No, I was actually at the Air Force Academy. Oh. Yeah. All right. Mm. Monterey's the best language. I asked for Monterey, but, yeah, but that's out of budget. Yeah. No, the, uh, so what you saw with, the, it's called the, the, the Party Congress. You saw the, I think it was the 20th Party Congress. It's the Party Congress that happens. It may have been the 50th. But it happens every it two years, every 10 years, something yeah, like that. Yeah, do we that? have the video? You should pull up the video, too. Um, there's so much video, it's going to be hard to find a the good The Jerusalem one. Post. Yeah, very reliable, very reliable source right there. Is it? No. <laughs> <laughs> Not even close. <laughs> it might as well just be called Israel's Always Right, The World is Always yes. Wrong Post. Wow. Yes. But, this uh, is how it happened. The rest of you are stupid. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> See you at the club. <laughs> See you at the club. But yeah, what... What's what you're seeing happen between China right now and the West, right? Let's just collectively call it the West is Xi Jinping is correctly realizing that this is this is a time to demonstrate unity and power in the East because the West is struggling under democracy, right? You've got NATO arguing with its with each other's members. You've got uh, you've got Hungary, a NATO partner altogether. Uh, actively trying to propose that Russia should be left alone, mm. right? Like you've got internal conflict in NATO. You have the disaster of what our of what our midterm elections just turned into, mm. right? Uh, basically, a how so? A, another gridlock, a, a gridlock, continued gridlock with with transfer of power looking like it's most likely going to go to the Republicans in Congress, which means the purse strings of the government are going to get tied down. So, you know, blue Senate, blue uh, executive. Uh, a red Congress. That mm -hmm. just means money's getting tight. Yep. Mm. It doesn't mean that we're going to start getting along. If anything, it means we're as divided as we've ever been. Yeah. And, and these elections are showing that it's right down the middle. So yeah. it doesn't so, matter. So what you know? Xi Jinping wants to do is he knows that the win for the, for China and the win for Chinese influence around the world is to show that China can get stuff done where the West can't even figure out their own backyard but why yeah. is he taking a senior citizen out of like the the nursing home? because Play the video? Hu, Hu Jintao is the only other person that carries anywhere near as much influence as Xi Jinping he doesn't look like he know he knows what he ate for lunch today yeah no. don't don't mistake the way that an old man looks yeah, he sat in Xi's seat before dude, she man. sat there look at this look at look at Xi's face look that is this. the ultimate like throw yeah. some sunglasses yeah. on him with a cigarette and say not in here bitch yep. he's like, like oh yeah so this is also important because if you watch Oh, is if he trying, you, to, if you get trying to, to resist? So if you get no, he's not resisting. He's just okay. he's just an old guy. He's asking questions. You see him keep reaching yep. for that sheet of paper. Yep. Why, why, he's trying to ask. Listen up, Julian. He's trying to ask questions about why changes were made to the panel without his approval. And now, as he's being marched out, watch how nobody yeah. looks at him. Nobody looks at him because they realize this is a move that she is making. So they're not looking. No eye contact. No eye contact. Yep. These are all people that have worked under Hu Jintao. Wow. And they're all essentially demonstrating their defer their deferral to xi jinping this is a clear message to the world that xi jinping wow. is the consolidated source of power in china and that they are unified behind xi jinping so what happened to him yeah we don't know we don't know what is probably his... nothing i mean the dude's the dude is a legend in china he's probably living in some nice pagoda up in the mountains oh, just that's nice being left alone All right he got right? a nice retirement package they yeah. gave him pebble beach he's too big to like, <laughs> too big to just be disappeared too important to be disappeared but could you imagine that ever happening here no imagine somebody walking sleepy joe out 
No. It'd go the wrong way. But, <laughs> oh, my gosh. So that guy's equivalent to, like, what? He's equivalent to, like, was Xi a, Jinping before Xi? Yeah, he was no. when Bush was around and, and oh, Obama shit. first came. Yep. Yeah, he's he's the guy that essentially so, modernized China, brought China into the fold of world superpowers. Why do you talk about, and, and I think some of it's obvious to people listening, but I just want to hear you express it. Like, when you're always going right to China as the main adversary here, and you, to quote you on the Patrick Beth David podcast, you said you were stationed in Asia. You're not allowed to say where, but what languages do you speak again? Thai, Chinese, and Japanese. Okay, so you said you do the math, right? So obviously this is a topic you know something about. Like what makes them the ultimate threat and, and like what's your worst case scenario with our relations with China over the next 10 years? Pardon this brief interruption, but I want to take a minute to talk about this incredible supplement that I've been using for over a year now after it was recommended to me by nutritional scientist, Dr. Dominic D'Agostino on this podcast. I take Dom's advice when it comes to anything related to nutrition, diet, and longevity, because as we get older, these things become more and more important. That is why I started using Verso. Verso is a company that is dedicated to translating scientific breakthroughs into products that hold the potential to increase longevity. I take Cell Being, this one right here, which contains nicotinamide mononucleotide or NMN based supplement paired with naturally derived micronized trans resveratrol and TMG. These two chemicals are actually precursors to what's called nicotinamide idenine dinonucleotide, which is commonly known as NAD. And NAD is essentially the precursor to energy, cell repair, and longevity. If you've ever tried fasting or even intermittent fasting and you've gotten that feeling of super high energy or mental clarity, it's because your body is activating these genes called sirtuins, which are actually longevity genes. The downside is as we age, NAD declines. When I found out I could naturally increase my body's activation of sirtuins and naturally activate my body's production of NAD, I was sold. And it is so much more affordable than doing NAD IV drips. Head on over to ver.com. S-O, and use the coupon code CONCRETE at checkout to save 15% on your entire order. That's K-O-N-C-R-E-T-E at checkout and get 15% off your entire order or you can just go to ver.so slash K-O-N-C-R-E-T-E. It's linked below. Back to the show. I, I look, here. here's what I, when I think about, and this has been going on forever, as long as I've been serving, it's been the same deal. And, and the fact of the matter is the Bureau has, Ne really not geared up on the side of foreign counterintelligence mm. on, on that side of the house. They've worried about other things that are here in our backyard in their mind, what they can see, the drugs, you know, the murder, the organized crime. Mm. In the meantime, they're just destroying every part of what we do and how we do it. And what I always look at is look at the focus on the face of 18 and 19 year old Chinese Communist Party soldiers. Look at that. Look at the ferocity. That comes with that. Look at, then look at our kids, look our, at our generation. Our, our military yeah, recruitment kind of, crisis right now? Exactly. We can, we actually lowered our standard by 10,000 and missed the, the quota by 15,000. We're not even getting new soldiers into our military We right can't now. do it. We can't find, and the, what they say is, well, we don't really want the kid with, you know, some type of indictment or some type of misdemeanor Need because that. you just don't know that. Listen, we have no choice. I, like I said, lowered it, lowered it by 10,000, missed it by 15. Th this has never happened ever, ever in the history of the military. So what do we do now? So then you got people talking about, well, we should have, you know, a two week service after high school. And then you go, All right, come on, are you fucking crazy? Parents will be, that'll be the most corrupt program in the history of the United States mm. as parents are buying their kids way out of it. So that's, it starts there. It starts with the commitment to country and cause. And so whatever's done there, and obviously we can only imagine what's done in order to keep that in place, and it's a high drive. You know, the culture is a high drive yeah. culture. Want to succeed, want to do more, um, want to come to the States, study at our Ivy League universities, do the things that they do. And it just carries over into, I, I would love to know what that guy was trying to put forward. Mm -hmm. What was he asking? Yeah. Oh, we'll he, never find that out. That's just true. <laughs> right? The reason that you see me jump right to China is because of, of three main things, right? First... We spent 20 years, just like Jim was saying, we spent 20 years fighting a global war on terrorism. Guess who wasn't involved in the global war on terrorism? Mm, yeah. China. So that means all of our money, all of our effort, all of our attention was fighting a, con a, 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 a transnational threat that China wasn't spending any time or any money on. 
And they were building. They were building building. and they were perfecting how they could penetrate the West because the West was distracted. And how are they doing that? Now here's, so that let's move on to point number two. And watching our mistakes, by the way. Watching what we did wrong. Whenever you go down into a mine, right? Back in the day, miners used to take, what was it, a parrot? A parakeet? Yeah, a canary. A canary, Canary. yeah. Yep. They used to take a canary down into a mine, right? And the reason, and it was because the canary, when the canary bit the dust, that's how they would know that there wasn't enough oxygen to keep the miners alive so they could get out. Our canary is Australia. Australia knows that. They've been our canary for a long time. So guess what happened about four years ago? Australia realized that Chinese were sending Chinese students, Chinese professors, Chinese mining experts into Australia specifically to undermine Australian politics, Australian student uh, 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 mindset and Mm. ideology. Mission accomplished. And guess who Australia's most important exporter, uh, export import partner is? China. And they were so upset. The Australians, God love them because they're just a fearless bunch of savages sometimes. They were like, we caught you, China. We're going to let the whole world know we caught you and we're going to penalize you, even though they know that penalizing China means penalizing themselves. Right. So Australia has been in this battle with the Chinese for like the last five years. Mm. But why were they the most totalitarian in the in the lens of what China was trying to do with when the pandemic just kept going on and on? Don't. You're, you're distract, you're distracted. That's distracted. That's a, yeah, that's an offshoot that's not relevant to your first question. Okay. Right? So we have our canary. So my three points, right? First, they didn't participate in the global war on terror. So they were just, they were mastering their future plan because they had a they had a 50-year plan, right? Then we have our canary go off, go off in Australia. And now the third point, they are, they are poised to become the world's economic superpower by 2032. Economics is the re- is what drives everything yes. in the, in human existence, mm. right? The more money you make, the more money you can spend developing weapons, the more military you can build, the more everybody else wants to be your friend mm. because you have the most money. What made the United States the, econ- the superpower that we are? Economics. Our economics are starting to fall behind Chinese economics. China knows that. So they're very focused on becoming the world's economic superpower. And once they're the economic superpower, then it's very, very hard for us to catch up after that, which is why you see the race kicking up now. Trump, Trump kind of called attention to it, but the world hated Trump. So the world was kind of not open to his point of view. Exactly. But one of the only policies that carried on from the Trump administration into the Biden administration were the China policies. Yes. I'm Mm. seeing that a lot. So those are my three points. Sorry to cut you off. No, no, no. That was that's outstanding. I I mean, that's outstanding. And you think about they're all in as well. Um, you know, we have I know we have offices near every major university. We at least have one person that sits that's, you know, an experienced counterintelligence person as experienced as the bureau can be. Um, and they sit outside these universities and they recruit assets within to find out what the deal is, whether or not they're, um, you know, actually like a proactive asset, somebody that's trying to do things to harm U.S. or whether they're just gathering information. And if you go to any any major financial institution mm-hmm. and or investment bank in the city, you will find interns within that organization who are being recalled back to China in order to report. And, and we're allowing it to happen. We are, we are kind of nervous about whether or not we should hire or fire or get rid of or even do background checks on these people, where they're coming from, what they're doing, what their incentive is, what their orders are, why they're going back, working for six weeks at a major New York corporation that's moving and shaking and then heading back for six weeks and then coming back to the States. Do you know, yeah. So Chinese, Chinese students make up the largest contingent of foreign students going yes. to American law schools. Yep. One out of every three of those graduates goes back to China. Why? Do, is it because they want to learn how to use our laws against us? We don't know what they do when they go back to China. But what we do know is that China knows how China's strategy. If you look at what they did in Hong Kong, yeah. if you look at how they've handled the Bahamas, That's if you look at how they handled the, the Central America, it certainly mm. suggests. What they do in the Bahamas? They the own, FDX? They own the Bahamas, right? <laughs> they, they, yeah. <laughs> FDX. Where, 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 hold oh on. My where God, were you guys bro. on where, Monday? Where, where is were that? both of you on oh Monday? Oh, my God. Where is that, where is that money? <laughs> that is yeah, fucking it's in your crazy. It's the bank account, Jim. At least he got dressed for his interview. <laughs> oh, <laughs> Yo, what is the <laughs> story Sorry, with the kid? I digress. Are you aware of the kid? What's the story with the, the kid? Sammy Bankman fine? Yes. Oh, the good. kid who got found drowned off What's the coast name? of Puerto Rico. Whoa. Sam no, wait a minute. Talk to me. Yeah. I got I got to send you the I got to send you the article. I know Julian sent me the article to it, but there's a kid who posted on Twitter. All right, he so said if you find you you tell the story. The founder of Maker Dow you're talking about. Yes, right? yes. 
The, no, the, so kid, the saying, kid who says, if I show up dead, I did not commit suicide. Yeah, and then so he showed up drowned. That, that oh, could be boy. Connected. Yeah, so he he sent out a tweet. This guy, Nikolai something. I'm going to text it to you, And Michael. he's he was one of the co-founders of MakerDAO. He sends out a tweet on October 28th that says something to the effect of, I don't have it in front of me, but it's like, I'm down in the Caribbean. My girlfriend turned out to be a spy. I am not going to kill myself, but if I died, there's an Israeli U.S pedo ring or something going on it sounded a little crazy going going on down here and then naturally people ran right with epstein because that was obviously something that happened Mm. and so two weeks later you have it's just weird that ftx and it's sbf but i what's the guy's name sam bankman i just texted you he's right here freed yeah Yeah, sam bank sam bankman freed i was saying it wrong but sam bankman freed the ceo of ftx that whole exchange crashes and he's in the caribbean in the bahamas and people are just like right away like oh it could absolutely have nothing to do with it but two crypto guys because by the way the dude who sent out that tweet found drowned two weeks later or two days later so actually died and now this all crashes and every single cryptocurrency like realm of the industry was tied in some way so th- to ftx wow. so jim jim they don't want they don't want to hear my comments no us. i want to hear a bit i want to hear we got to get back to the bahamas do we I'm need a tinfoil hat for this on the chinese oh, yeah, yeah, i want to yeah. know that yeah no you need to take off your tinfoil hat if you're gonna listen to me <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> and and freaking julian's got a beautiful tinfoil hat sometimes he does <laughs> i envy it <laughs> I wear it did you get the article michael um I'm trying to hold on okay so essentially, let's let's start with FTX because I think this okay. is super important, right? So, if you take FTX by itself, right? What was FTX for anybody who who isn't super into crypto? FTX is uh, is argue was arguably the mm-hmm. second largest foreign exchange uh, uh, exchange or currency cryptocurrency open market exchange place mm-hmm. available to anybody in cryptocurrency, mm. right? The first largest is a place called Binance. The second largest was FTX, right? Or was was Sam Bankman Fried Freed's mm. uh, company? Who had Binance? Who was that? Let's get. To I that. heard that All guy. Right. Shady. Let's get to yeah, that yeah. in a second. I heard the Binance guy really shady. Let's get yeah. to that in a second. It's easy. So Binance made a play to buy FTX, mm-hmm. right? That was the play. Everything rallied. Everybody's happy now. What kind of market have we been in for the last nine months? Down market. Six months. Down market. Right. What have cryptocurrencies done for the last six months? Crashed and decreased in value. Mm. Right. And what's FTX looking for? I'm looking for a way to subsidize the fact that they've lost a shit ton of money. Because when people when they lose money, what that means is people are taking their cryptocurrency out and exchanging it for fiat currency. So if you remember, it's a wonderful life. If you guys remember that the old movie. movie. Yeah. Great movie. Yeah. Do you remember the run on the bank? Yeah. Yes. That's that's exactly what happened in cryptocurrency. Yes. People saw their their assets were decreasing in value, so they made a run on the bank and they yeah. started taking their money out. And it well, wasn't there. It wasn't there. Exactly right. When when Binance found out it wasn't there, then they pulled out. Do you know what they did before that? Though? So now what you've got, what you've got is essentially FTX standing by itself, over leveraged, under resourced in a crash. Right now. So that's that's how the whole crash happened. It has nothing to do with the Bahamas, has nothing to do with anything else. Do you know about before, though? But what, what Binance did before? Go ahead. You didn't say it. I did, this is important context. Yeah, yeah. Binance announced, I guess like eight or nine days ago, that they were selling their 2.1 billion or something reserves of FTT, which is the token of FTX. And they didn't say why, but they said, you know, we'd like to be responsible for the Correct. market and do it in an orderly manner. And that's what that's what that was the main driver to cause people to withdraw it. So then they were looking to buy it, and then they're like, oh no, your balance sheet's fucked. It's sketchy. It's very sketchy. I, I'm not saying it's not sketchy. Now let's go back to the question that Jim asked. Who owns Binance? Mm. Anybody care to guess? CZ? No, I'm going to guess that's not the answer. No, it's a, it's, it's a Chinese organization. <laughs> and let me ask you this question. Is cryptocurrency legal in China? No. No. It was outlawed two months Wait, ago. Wait, I thought mining was... Mining's still alive and well. But they they have no problem using Chinese servers to mine it and then sell it to the United States. Oh. But there is no cryptocurrency allowed inside China until China creates their own state, state CBDC. controlled. Mm, right. That's amazing. So Didn't basically, if you want, you want, let me put on my tin hat now. You basically have a Chinese firm knowing that they can mess with the market and have zero impact on their own people, make a large reinvestment of currency into the market. What happens when you flood a market with currency? 
you decrease the value of that yep. currency. So they they cause a flood, they decrease the value, and then they make two public announcements that basically bring into question FTX, their only competitor and the second largest crypto company out there. Yeah. Were they looking to crash it? Probably not. They were probably just looking to cause pain the same week as a midterm, you know, on the yeah. verge of whether yep. or not we were going to be going into a recession. They were probably just looking to cause pain at all. But this was in excess of the pain they were looking to create. And now what we essentially have is the largest cryptocurrency exchange in the world is controlled by the Chinese, which is the only country in the world that doesn't use crypto. What's what? your average what's your average age of the crypto investor? What generation is that? That's a your generation? 21 maybe? Right? All right, the so, 20s, I guess. So 20s. who So who are the folks that control these midterms? What voter? What what group? 20 to 29s? Well, nice these job. midterms, nice, we I saw have no nice idea. Job. Nice job, Chinese. Mm. Yeah, this is, it's, the, I see what you're saying. it's a big economic war. It's, I, now, am I, do I see every ghost as the Chinese? No, I don't see every ghost as the Chinese. But when it comes to I economics. I think we should look at it, though. When man, it comes to we economics. Look at if if they're, they're the folks. Yeah. When it comes to economics. Oh, man. They're savvy. They're super yeah. savvy. And it's really interesting that they're so savvy because in their system, economics works completely differently. Mm -hmm. But when you have one out of every three lawyers studying U.S. law, going back to China, they've all got gainful employment when they get there. How effective is China's intelligence apparatus? I mean, I assume it's very effective, but like relative to the CIA, relative to the FSB, Mossad, like where, how do you view what China is capable of and, and how they go about doing the job? Cutthroat. That's the difference. Hmm. What we do is really good. What they do is cutthroat. They they have no problem. They have war casualties. They're assassins. Are not, yeah, war, war casualties is not an issue. It's 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 a different mo. Yeah, it's a different, it's different modus, they modus think. operandi. Yeah, like we're trying to be clandestine. Yes, we try to get in, get out. Nobody knows that we're there. Yep, it's important. The Chinese are bulls in a china shop. They they, they want to come in, break everything, and leave a calling card. Because then, guess what? <laughs> then we talk about it. Right, they left a calling card when they when they when they hacked into the uh, Office of Personal Management System with the yes. DoD. They stole like sixty mm. percent of the yeah. records in, in OPM. By and, the way, my ex is trying to get a settlement. I mean, I'm like whatever. And then okay. they told the whole and then they told the whole world. That. And then they told the whole world we did it. Right, and then the whole world was like, "Oh shit!" The Chinese can hack into the American like military personnel system. That's how they do it. It's the exact opposite of what Russia does. It's a do it's a totally different mo. They don't need to be clandestine because they basically have a culture where every Chinese person who affiliates with the mainland in any way, no matter where they are in the world, aligns as a mainlander first, right? They're a Chinese something, Chinese American, Chinese French, Chinese whatever, but they're Chinese first. Mm. What is their ultimate goal? Economic superiority. I think, yeah, I think just it's like 19 to 12 right now. So you think by 2032, it's not me. That's economics. They've passed that. Yeah, GDP, yeah, that's, I'm talking. If, yeah, if you if you just look at if you just look at the numbers that are out there posted by Harvard Business Review, mm. by you know uh, Brookings Institute, they're predicted to be the economic superpower by by. Well, Apple's trying to take their their slave yeah. trade out of China and put it in Vietnam now. Trying. And they're trying. Are more companies going to do that? Because obviously that's the one thing about COVID I, I don't understand because they've basically with going so with China, I'm talking about going so hard on COVID, they shocked the system and forced multinationals around the world, not just in the U.S., to have to evaluate their supply chains within China and adjust to other places, which is literally the opposite of what China should want. No. China knows that they're always going to have, we're calculating time like Americans. <laughs> Americans look at time as like two years is a long time. Yeah. No, you're right. Right. Yeah. Our, and even in, in our government, the longest, I think in our government, the longest approved budget is five years. That's right. Is that right? Is there a longer That's budget That's exactly that? right. And then you have the contingency, the holdover that goes on for maybe six months before it's renewed. In China, about that. like one man can basically write a line item that lasts 35 years. That's isn't, probably what happened. Isn't that, that a deal? big problem that we have presidents only last four down. years here? They technically presidents only last two years here because then they spend two years right exactly running for re-election, either re running or in second term lame duck. Yeah, and, you know they're not out. paying attention. No, they have nothing. Yeah, not paying attention. How much power do you think the president has these days? I, I think the president, in large part, has mixed power. Right? There's the executive order power. 
because what's happened for like 20 years is Congress has been letting the president make whatever decisions they want to make. We saw Obama create the most executive orders in history until Trump came mm -hmm. around, until Biden came around. Mm -hmm. Like we, we are now to a place where we are basically um, policying through executive orders because you know nobody else unless you own the senate and the house it's impossible That's to get exactly anything through. right uh so the the president has been getting a lot of power but their power has always lied with the congress mm. it's just when congress outsources their power to the executive branch then they get to they get to claim that it's not their fault when they run for re-election which they have to do every two years so what is this story this is the this is the guy this is the kid who drowned right what exactly did he say this Nikolai is Mashigian. Balancer Labs. Okay, has drowned in Puerto Rico. Local media say he developed. He's the developer of Maker Dow. Mm -hmm. So yeah, yeah go to his tweet. Sir. There's his tweet. Yep. CIA and Mossad and pedo elite are running some kind of sex trafficking entrapment blackmail ring out of Puerto Rico and the Caribbean islands. They are going to frame me with a laptop planted by my ex girlfriend, who was a spy. They will torture me to death. I mean, I think this is pretty, I mean, this is pretty tied up nice in a little bow. Jim, this is, there's no way to question this. No. <laughs> well, Except it happened least. on Twitter. He's probably verified. It's, he was not. No, this was before. He drowned before, <laughs> unfortunately. Before yeah. he could get Twitter blue. Yeah. Elon I, hadn't released it yet. I just don't yet. see how that could possibly happen, you know, without him actually doing it. Yeah. Um, but drowning is a hell of a way to go. You know what the Bahamas is, right? What it's the Bahama Triangle? It's, no, it's a series. A it's a <laughs> series of islands. What do you think the most common way of dying in the Bahamas probably is? It's not going to be like getting shot by a gang member. Mm. Do you think STG's a guy who's inventing? Do you think the guy who's drowning. inventing At crypto Atlantis. on the computer every day is out there At going Bournemouth. for a fucking swim? No, two this guy's not going that. in the water. Come on. I'm thinking a guy who's inventing crypto every day probably got drunk one day, got caught in a riptide, and didn't have what it took to swim back. How to shore. perfectly, but two tied weeks together. after he posted this tweet. Two days. Two days? I think two weeks. You guys, two days. So you guys have said two, two weeks and two days. No, October 28th is the tweet. He was dead by Halloween. You sure he wasn't dressed as somebody else? <laughs> it's Halloween. Or did he just, um, or was it like a, like a, was he trying to get attention to commit suicide or something? And just trying I mean, to you're the same, yeah. Andy, you're the same guy who said, yeah, this is right. back in the day. Or you're the same going, guy who said on a Reddit feed right. when you were doing an out. AMA, one of the questions was, was right. what does the CIA and they may have said and other intelligence organizations do that crosses the line of morals like are they into whether it be like sex trafficking or having to do things that are that are totally insane to be able to get intelligence and you answered it very very honestly I, incredibly honestly you said something to the effect of there are things that make me lose sleep at night that we do that i'd rather not talk about in a reddit forum here which is not no right it's not no if you look at this th this has so many red flags in it that make me just it does it, that just right. so we've got to take that for what it is like okay. did the guy die two days later yes yeah. is that correlation or is that causation we don't really know right right you tell me that a, you tell me that a potentially unfit guy drowns in the bahamas okay that's unfortunate and then you show me a tweet that says cia and Mossad and pedo elite <laughs> yeah yeah it's a lot some kind it of is. Sex but but wait but then it gets even better blackmail. it's a blackmail entrapment ring out of puerto rico so and oh by the way i will be i will be uh framed by my ex-girlfriend using my laptop because she's a spy okay but you know, you know how many perfect things have to line up for this to be true where's the laptop has anybody interviewed the girl? Well, scroll down. Ask that question. Scroll down. <laughs> <laughs> it's actually with it's with Hunter. Where's it's with Hunter Biden? Exactly. <laughs> scroll down. So yeah, this this has got me not suspicious. Yeah, but of how CIA, do you? But this has got like was the dude knocked off by some like some organized criminal for some other reason? Who knows? Right. This one here. Oh, yeah, okay. Dead. Oh, this is just it's dark, really dark theme. Right. <laughs> they yeah. will torture me to death. Yep. What day was this? The same that day. Was the 28th. Yeah. The 28th. That's the same tweet. Oh, it's the same so tweet. He I missed dealing, the torture me to death. Keep going. Yeah. Yeah. Admittedly, when I hear the words right. like CIA, Mossad, and pedo Sunday elite, night. it seems like a lot. To me. Three possible futures for me: one, suicided by the CIA; two, CIA brain damaged slave <laughs> asset; three, <laughs> worst nightmare of people who fucked with me up until now. And I am sure these are that's the only it options. i mean that's a tough three you guys would say, i could <laughs> see i could see you guys three. taking a trip down memory yeah. lane yeah. Reading yeah. This one. you're like suicided, oh yeah i remember that suicided by cia that's one i don't like that 
CIA brain damage, slave asset. Okay, so I really don't know what happened. I mean, a brain um, damage slave asset is super useful. Though. It's really good. <laughs> what have we I, done? All right, in, in, be, a, on, in a serious manner, and I don't like see my issue with people online who complain about everything just to do it, like the Twitterati. I can tell you exactly about. why CIA wouldn't kill this guy. Not because even, of no, this conversation. Not, that is exactly why they wouldn't touch this guy. And then this reverse psychology person would say, and that's exactly why they would. Yeah, and the reverse psychology, and the, no one believes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And the reverse psychology person would never, right, ha would never have actual insight into what happens at CIA because they specialize in reverse psychology. But the people who are online who just complain about the CIA all day and say like, defund the CIA, defund the FBI, and shit, like, I don't, I think that's insane because you you have to have this stuff. You you are you're a powerful country. People out there want this country dead right like there's enemies in the world whether you like it or not that's what it is but it doesn't mean that like a guy like me who knows that also wouldn't know or not know also wouldn't be able to speculate that perhaps things in this realm happen and by the way if given the context not that i would ever deserve it because i'm some private guy in a fucking armchair but if given the context i'd say wow that really sucks but i get it Life without CIA or FBI is like life without food and water. Yep. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I would I would assign CIA is going without CIA is like going without food. Mm -hmm. You're going to last a while. It's just not going to be pretty. Mm. Going without FBI. Yeah, that's like luck. going without water. Mm. You know what this country would turn into in about three days without the Federal Bureau of Investigation doing what it does? I mean, well, you I, correct I, me if I'm wrong, man. I but. think you're absolutely right. Uh, my issue is just the leadership at the top at this point, I think, needs to be. We don't have the meticulous well, let me not say that. That's not true. We, we have a, a good portion of the Bureau who is meticulous about their investigations. We have a good portion of the agency who is meticulous about their asset collection and how they utilize that information and report it. Um, I think the, the biggest problem that I see is those folks that are leading the charge that have become politicized, especially in my organization, you know, have become politicized to, to getting the huge headline. Mm. You know, what are... Looking at these elections and what the Bureau has done and basically saying, just why, why not just realize American votes are not for the person who's running against the red. It's because they just hate the person who is going to run for the red. <laughs> That's what it comes down to. So how do we not meticulously go through this and figure out where it's coming from? We know where it's coming from. It's out there. It's coming from China, period. That's where it's coming from. It's where it's been coming from since 2013. That's what it is. And I don't understand all, all these other things are based on the fact that this is someone who is brilliant in certain ways with regards to what he did on the crypto side, but really has no understanding of how things work, even on a basic level. Yeah, they, oh, he only saw three futures and these were his That's three it. futures. And he said, I am sure there's these are the only options. Yeah. I am sure of it. Okay. Okay. There's plenty of other options like shit. You should have swam before you went and not had 15 <laughs> drinks and two blows of Coke and nothing. Maybe this would not have happened, but I get it. You know, I get it. But I think that's kind of where we're at. I, I totally agree. Without us, it's impossible to move forward, but we need to do a much better job oh, yeah. at what we're doing. It's funny because you, you landed on something that's a distinct difference between the two agencies. FBI wants to get into the headlines. They want to show their impact. They want to show their victories. They want to be able to secure future funding. CIA wants to stay out of headlines. Absolutely. We actually have a quote unquote Washington Post test. Like that is something that, that every manager in CIA is familiar with. A Washington Post test? When you propose an operation or when you propose five operations to solve a problem, the first sniff test that we all have after we, we lay the five options on the table and they're like, okay, guys, Washington Post test. Which of these five options is going to land mm, on the I front love page that. of the Washington Post if we fuck this up? I love that. And then if there's two or three of them, Boom, they're gone. And you have the editor right there assessing. <laughs> <laughs> and, and we most likely have the exact Sorry, opposite yes. test. Yep. How do we get this in the Washington Post? Yep. <laughs> Seriously. Oh, nope, that's not going to do it. Oh, that is. There it is. There it is. Let's go to let's go raid the house when we can just use a forthwith subpoena. Let's go raid the house with boats and choppers and everything else. Public deterrent, private mm, deterrent. Yeah. That's really. Yeah, that's I mean, it's difference. two different. It's, it's two different worlds, right? Yes. The, the American people want to see the FBI doing their job. They want to see the FBI raiding a house with like jackets and helicopters and big guns. What they don't want to see is the way that China gets a North Korean general to give us the placements on a missile. They don't want to see the bill for how much booze we send him. 
They don't want to know that we sent the guy on a paid vacation to Thailand to sex to sex tourism sell silly. Like they don't want to hear. They don't want to see that. I thought he was going somewhere. How'd you like that? How'd you like to have that job? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. A lot of grenades out there, if you know what I mean. <laughs> Playing volleyball in a minefield, yeah, yeah, something like that. But it's. I mean, at the end of the day, too, when you look at the two organizations and their history, it does all come back to like pre nine eleven. That's where the conversation goes because. And you were there, obviously, mm -hmm. after, but you know about this because we oh, talked about it. Absolutely. You were there before. Pre-9-11, see, like, not a lot of FBI agents are like you, Jim, like, with your background. For people that don't know, like, you went, you were West Point, Army Ranger. You did undercover missions around the world on behalf of the Army. You well, were, I was still an active Army officer, by Right, which, right. Like, and it's, you almost, were, it's over four years. You were recruited by both, right? FBI yeah. and CIA. Yeah. So you you always had a network across agencies so you got along with people but well i think that's what it is it's one it's relationships yes. first and we forgot that along the way yeah. so it became competition so yeah. and it became who the asshole was here versus who the asshole was there and we both have assholes so. and in the build-up to that yeah 9-11 gets caught in the middle because you had like i mean we've seen the looming tower you read the book yeah like, ver very good that too. was real very good Th there yeah. were there was basically john o'neill like, had a huge personality yes. so so did some of the others right and so you had like this butting heads and then after 9 11 it seems like there's still when you talk to certain guys like you had kiriaku in here he was talking about it with like the fbi like joking like oh god the fucking fbi yeah, like yeah, there's yeah. still some <laughs> of that but there was a lot more work integrated together around the world started to connect the dots together as so, opposed to separately comparing after we looked at them and said well really, we don't understand so started how does to that work, work that together that's the qu that's my relationships question. 101 relationships 101 and actually having the ability to meticulously and systematically going through the problem yeah it, but pre 9 11 there was not a, a large impetus for uh for collaboration Right. FBI was focused on what FBI was. CIA was focused on what CIA was. Keep in mind, too, CIA was small before 9-11. Mm -hmm. I don't know how much the 9 I don't know how much the 9-11 commission impacted hiring at FBI. It did. It pumped it up pretty good. And, and it also moved us into that world mm -hmm. where I think I said it before. Uh, the broken toys went to counterterrorism an organization. Oh, my God, the dude's not coming to work. He's not doing it. You know what? Right. Send him over to CT. In the meantime, we got, you know, basically memos saying, hey, there's dudes down in Arizona that just want to learn how to. They don't need caring about taking off or flying or yeah. landing. Oh, I can yeah. see the comments. Yeah, right 63 now. pages, you know. So anyway. So that was pre-9-11. So then 9-11 happens. Everybody everybody sees what happens at 9-11, right? And then when the 9-11 the, uh, the Commission report investigation starts, the 9-11 Commission starts, now they start picking up the scrappings on the scraps on the floor. And they start saying, hey, FBI said this. CIA said this. They sent it to each other. Neither side actually read it. Like, it, if you... if the average person understood how like incredibly administrative and mundane the life is of a CIA or FBI officer. They would immediately reject it and turn on Netflix and watch the next spy movie, right? It is an incredibly dull, boring, detail-oriented life, which is why you keep hearing Jim refer back to systematic meticulous because you have to be meticulous. You have to be systematic. 300 intel reports could come in from each side and, the, and there's one nugget one thread that ties five of them together. The only way you see that is if you meticulously comb, comb through each one. And they're written in completely different formats with completely different acronyms, completely yeah. different languages. Not to mention the fact that when CIA sends FBI a memo, the FBI analyst has to compare that against all the other new FBI memos that came in the same day and, mm. and justify why he's reading one memo over another to his boss. Mm. It's like, it's, it's not an excuse, it's a reality of what existed before 9-11. And then on top of that, you had multiple different times. Of, you have Cold War culture permeating. Our big enemy was the Soviet Union still, because don't forget the Soviet Union fell in, what, 91? Yep. Yeah. So, and then the Soviet states fell apart and we were like, oh, what are we gonna do now? It was the beginning of the global war on terror. So the, the world was a very, very different place in 2001 when this happened. And what do you it, mean it was the beginning of the global war on terror? 2001 was the beginning of the Oh, I thought you said war. 91. Well, no, Sorry, talking about that. the fall, fall okay. of the Soviet yes. Union and, yeah. and really how many agents and, right. and operate, you know. You had 10 years there where we were basically enemy and target lists. Like, yep. what are we going to focus on? Yep. We're going to focus on crime. We're going to focus on, I guess, collecting. Got it. Right? Yeah, so, I mean, that all went away. Like, at one point in time, New York <laughs> office, 12... 1200 agents in the new york office i i thousand of them were working you know spy stuff wandering mm. around the streets following and that was a good way to kind of 
you know, Russian spies. I mean, we had the Soviet Union, we had the Soviet bloc. We needed to do that, we thought. Let everything else go. And that's happened through the course of the Bureau. That's happened over time, too. We've had directors, you know, Bob Mueller came in, Comey came in with their different, de- hey, we don't we don't work organized crime. We think we really did a great job on that. Mm. It's over. It's <laughs> okay. Over. <laughs> yeah, that's not going mission on Mission accomplished. You know, Bush, yeah. But it's just kind of, the, yeah, <laughs> mission accomplished. But, but that's kind of, I think the other thing is our solution to the failure to connect dots together was to change our reporting system. Mm-hmm. Mm. So, okay, we need to put in a new system that allows people to search each that's not what it is. Yeah. It's basically putting analysts side by side with both you know, the agency and us and trying to get down to the to the facts. The, the, get a system down. Get your operations down. Get your system down so you understand when something comes in, how it flows, and how to be efficient, mm-hmm. how to be effective, to get the information out to people who are doing the interrogations, doing the interviews, you know, doing the search warrants, convincing U.S. Attorney's Office that this is important. And here's the reasons why, because we've got we've corroborated with the agency. They've corroborated with us certain facts. We, we got it asked backwards. Oh, no, we just need a new one hundred and seventy million dollar computer <laughs> system. No, you don't, because if no one knows what to do with it, it doesn't really matter. And we're going to we're going to pay Deloitte to tell us that we need that. <laughs> exactly. Oh, and then right. we're going to pay get the big and then we're going right. to pay. We're going to pay Microsoft to build it custom for us. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And by the way, Deloitte has the guys that left the bureau because they saw it coming <laughs> and said, you know what? I'll just be a consultant for Deloitte on this project. Yeah. And I'll make a million dollars as opposed to one seventy one, two sixty eight, thirty nine. In a good year, um, <laughs> if the budget was continuing. But seriously. You say that number in your sleep, I can tell. Yeah. Like sometimes you're saying. I, I cruised past that. I was at 172 something. But mm, you were up there. Oh, well, cranky. Moving along. Cranky. But like, what did you guys have? With, obviously, the, that's that's good color commentary on, I guess, like the way that the approaches need to mesh. But when you guys did suddenly start entering all kinds of missions with each other internationally right like i'm I'm focused on the war on terrorism right now after after 2001 like it always seems to me when i'm reading these stories or here or reading a book or someone recounting it that like the the overlap is you guys are all kind of doing the same thing even though you're coming from technical different expertise in a way like cop spies supposed to be it seems like for example like the al zabeda thing when when you had it in kiriako in here talking about it like they're all the FBI and CIA, like if, if you were just someone looking on the street and like trying to evaluate wh- who's wearing what uniform, you wouldn't even know without the letters on their back. So, yeah, I would I mean, there's significant differences to somebody who knows what to look for. Mm. But you're right to the to the average bobblehead out there to me. Yeah, there they're, they're not going to know the difference between us. Right. If you saw me and Jim, if we're doing our job right, you're going to underestimate both of us and just walk by us both. Right. You're going to be like, mm. ah, handsome old guy, ah, handsome hairy guy. and You're going to move on with your life. Yep. In an ideal world. I don't think yep. they give us handsome, though. <laughs> no, no, definitely not. <laughs> but that's very true. But though. that's how we want to look. That's how we, we want to look to the average bobblehead like we're nothing. Mm. It's, it's what we want. The thing is, once you're actually once you actually know how the two sides work, once you can identify the culture or the personality differences or the, the unique aspects of each of us in that way, it it becomes more clear. Mm. Right. There's there's a certain edge to FBI officers because they they deal with the scum of the universe in their own country, right? Every time they go head to head against an American criminal, like that's, it, it's a personal affront because this is an American citizen who they're sworn to protect, who's now like threatening mm-hmm. them and threatening the country they stand for. For us, we never go head to head with an American scumbag. Our scumbags are all foreign scumbags who really we want to use to gain an edge for the American people. So we kind of want to enable them to continue being scumbags. Mm -hmm. Completely different mentality. So we are much more conniving and manipulative. They are much more like direct and in your face. They're law enforcement. They have a badge and a gun and they're not afraid to use either one. For us, we intentionally want to hide everything we have until the last possible moment. So when you when you get to know us, you'll see the difference fast. The FBI did move more, a little bit more towards intelligence gathering. That, though. that was smaller. I mean, that was right. 9-11 driven. You okay. know, we had, we had to, but if you, I will still say, now I don't know what's happened in the last five years, but I will still say that um, our intel collection and the analysis process still has a long way to go 
You know, we we rely on we still rely too much on flipping checks, looking at accounts and, you know, looking at things to, to say, oh, yeah, we're going right. to be able to take this information and then turn it into questions where the agency is amazing at taking as much as they can out of the person who can who they can turn and manipulate and do what they need mm-hmm. to do in order to gain and garner the information that benefits us, too. Now, some some agents are really good at source development, so they some people don't even they, they never look at a checking account. They never look at the money. They just grind the guy out until they get what they need. But it's not across the I wouldn't say it, it's across the board that we're really good at asset development where these guys, it's their masters. Right. So think like FBI has a lot of duties of which one is counterintelligence. CIA, mm. we are an intelligence organization of which no part of our organization is law enforcement. Right. The uh, again, getting into the administrative minutia that nobody cares about, we're given the executive branch ga- gives us different authorities to operate in different ways intentionally so that if we want to maximize our, our operations, we have to work with FBI. Mm-hmm. And if FBI wants to maximize their operational utility, they have to work with us because we are granted different authorities to do different types of things. And both of us really want to work with Department of Homeland Security. And both of us really want to work with NSA because they have different authorities that we don't have. Right. It's like when you give your kids all one cookie to make mm. sure that nobody gets to eat all dozen cookies kind of thing. How come nobody talks about Mexico and what China's involvement is in Mexico as far as trafficking fentanyl into Mexico and, oh, and let's buying go, up baby. all the lithium mines and hiring the cartel to be their security while they are fucking extracting all the lithium out of the mines and buying up all this shit in Mexico? There are people talking about that. It's just not the headlines that are talking about that. Right. It's really hard to sell an ad spot on a blog or on a news post when you're talking about cr- criminal activity against Mexicans in Mexico. That That's not going to make somebody click on a link next to the current midterm results mm-hmm. or next to uh, Ukrainians raising flags in, in Harrison City. But what if you finish the headline with the people trafficking fentanyl across the border that's killing Americans every single right. day? I mean, now they're clicking. Yeah, it's some sometimes. But is it is it still going to be what drives the click compared to some other headline at the time? Right. You're you're exactly right when it comes to Chinese involvement in third world countries around the world and developing nations around the world. That's their M.O. Just like we were talking about M.O. That's what they're doing in the Bahamas. They're basically they're positioning themselves in every third world country that has a port that handles the transfer, extraction or delivery of rare earth minerals, weapons and heavy infrastructure, dual use technology, Mm -hmm. because if they have a partnership with and they always seek partnerships they don't Mm. ever seek like dominance that's the american way is to go in and basically say we own this port and you have no access to it the chinese go in and say we're gonna build the port for you (laughs) we're gonna we're gonna bring in chinese people to run the port we'll teach you how to run the port yourselves we'll even pay taxes on the port so that you have more money in your pocket but you're gonna grant us a hundred year lease to use the port so isn't in a, isn't Mexico in a sense like Ukraine to us? Like we're Russia and Mexico is our Ukraine and China is the United States. Like China is doing all this stuff to to mm. to, to infiltrate Mexico and get and fuck up the United States. And then is there except, is there any chance we would ever invade uh, Mexico? Except for the fact that we don't have an economic we don't have an economic reliance on Mexico like like Russia has on Ukraine. If you mm. if you pull up a map, we it's have tons just, of factories and shit in Mexico, don't are we? Are you talking about the supply chain to the black city? Yeah. Correct, mm. correct, correct. Yeah. No. So I mean, are there commercial companies that have a where a factory in Mexico? Yes, and they okay. also have a factory in Tennessee and in Vietnam and in whoever you know. There's they're diversified. Mm-hmm. They have five of them in China. Okay. So this I, I wouldn't say that there's. I don't think it's realistic in any way to think that America is going to invade Mexico. No. There's uh, for the American. Trump wanted to for the American military <laughs> oh, yeah. to invade a neighboring country. It's it's not it's not our strategy. It's not how we operate, especially not when we can just write a big check and have something happen much faster than if we were to mobilize M1 Abrams. Do the cartels benefit us at all? Here's the the issue that we're having now with with legitimate United States businesses that are trying to move product to or get product from Mexico because there's some there's some there's some military hardware there's different computer systems that need to get in and out the problem they're having is the cartels control those paths those supply chains so really no 
you know, not only are they moving drugs that are killing our kids and killing a lot of people, but they're also not allowing um, without huge, you know, huge markups in order for us legitimate logistics companies to get in there with product or come out with it. That's the big issue. Everything from cars. I mean, think Mercedes has a huge plant in yeah. Mexico City. So, uh, but they can't move the product without paying an upcharge. And it's a significant mm. upcharge or it's, what I worry about is it's, you know what, just look the other way what's coming in with these, you know, 50 S classes. Oh. You know what I mean? So that's, I think that's going a, a little bit far, stretching a little bit far, but it's possible. You know, so I think that's kind of the issues that we're having there on the side of crime and on the side of how the cartels control every single thing. And then moving people through is, is I mean, that's that's but, an organized scheme, what you're seeing at the borders. What was your boy saying, Danny? What was the, I forget the guy's name. You had a man who was like, oh, Luis Chaparro. Yeah, Luis. He, what was he saying about the CIA with the cartels? He was saying that the CIA, he's saying that with unequivocally, the CIA works with the cartels. I don't know one way or the other. It, it, there, there was one guy and in particular, there was a documentary made about him. He was CIA and DEA, I believe. And uh, he was actually murdered by a CIA agent in a cartel drug house, like in one of the cartel owned houses. And this is like, this has been verified and there's like documentaries about it and stuff like this. Um, and uh, I wish I could remember the name of the guy right now. Fuck. Anyways, it was a, in the DEA office, in Mexico City, I believe the DEA agent was tortured. Kiki Van Kiki, Kiki. yeah, yes, yes, yeah. yes. Kiki Rodriguez. I was gonna say Van Dewey. That was the that was a fucking GM his name. Of the nuggets. I, Kiki Rodriguez. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Kiki was the DEA guy who got murdered, and um, eventually they captured some of the cartel guys, and the cartel guys basically unveiled the who the guy was who actually murdered Kiki and it wasn't a CIA agent who lives in Florida right now. I can't remember his name. Mm. You're going to have him in? No, I don't think he'll answer my emails. But. <laughs> <laughs> do you have a name? Did you do it? it it's on the internet if you could find we'll it. If you down. could find who's the CEA, who is the CEA agent who murdered Kiki Rodriguez. Oh, when he gets drowned in Puerto Rico, we'll know fucking answer yeah. it. Yeah, look for his tweets. That's it. It's not intimate. But, Drowning um, is so, not intimate. So who, I mean, why wouldn't the... United States invade Mexico if China has its claws so deep in Mexico and it's hurting the United States so much. Like if the if they're so invested in Mexico and working alongside the cartels, why wouldn't we just overtly go in there? Because there's two there's two types of wars. One is a profitable war, one is a not profitable war, right? And those two types of war are called interstate war and intrastate war. Mm. Interstate war is sovereign nation against sovereign nation. It's extremely expensive. It is not economically sustainable. It's when one country invades another country. It's what Russia doing. It's what Russia is doing to Ukraine right now. That is not a profitable war for either side. Intrastate war is a civil war. In a civil war, it's extremely profitable for anybody participating in the civil war from outside of the country. Why did we get involved in Syria? Why did we get involved in Yemen? Why did we get involved in Libya? Why are we involved in Ukraine? It's extremely profitable to be the person who's sending humanitarian aid, building influence, soft power, hard power, sending weapon systems, you know, Radeon, you know, whatever it might be. It's extremely probably part of an intrastate war, right? So what when the United States watches what China's doing around the world in third world countries through the Belt and Road Initiative, through, uh, through whatever policies China's uh, executing to build infrastructure and everything else, that's, that is is something that, that the United States would prefer to continue to combat economically. Because once they commit troops on the ground, you're not only paying the cost in terms of dollars and cents, but the cost in terms of lives, the cost in terms of public response, it's nasty. 9-11, if, if anybody alive during 9-11, America was, was hard up and, and ready to rock and roll and send boots on the ground for about five years. And then after that, the death toll and the lack of results, even though it wasn't anywhere close to what it was in Vietnam, it was it turned the appetite of the American people against the... Yeah, because they started a bad war we didn't need. That Like Afghanistan, listen, you had to brother, go to. Listen, but... what you are spouting right now is what you have seen since 9-11. The day, the day that 9-11 happened, people wanted blood immediately. Oh, no, no, no. Oh, I, yeah. I, no, no. So just to be clear, I, I always say this, absolutely had to go to Afghanistan. Afghanistan was a thousand percent should have been there. October all 701, the way. yeah, I mean, all the was, way. That was a mission. I'm that talking to be about Iraq. when they took their eye off the ball and they went to Iraq 
where he's got WMDs. Mm -hmm. No, he didn't. Dick Cheney walked in there and said, Mr. President, what if there was a 1% chance Saddam had WMD, blew (laughs) someone up, and it was on your ass? And he's like, God damn it, Dick, we're going in. And he (laughs) wanted to go in to finish his dad's fucking job. And so then we get caught up in this whole war, and that's where the tide turned. And that's why also then, and this is a separate conversation, but 20 years later, we have the fuck up with Afghanistan because the resources were pulled out of there. Like, I see the difference between the two, and I look at this and I go, how can you not say that Iraq is a product of a profitable war, as you say? Which I, I understand exactly why you're saying that. There's people out there who will just hear that word and immediately go to, like, military-industrial complex. Right. When they're thinking about Iraq, though, they're right about that. Okay. So this is yeah, this is Kiki. This is Kiki. I can't read that. Can you read that, Julian? Kiki Salazar was an American intelligence officer for the United States DEA in February 1985. Camarena, oh yeah, Kiki Camarena Salazar. Camarena was kidnapped by drug traffickers hired by Mexican politicians in Guadalajara. And so whoa, whoa, like, oh, you're zooming in. Oh, go. go. Three leaders of the Guadalajara drug cartel were eventually convicted in Mexico for Camarena's murder. The U.S. investigation into Camarena's murder led to 10 more trials in Los Angeles for other Mexican nationals involved in the crime. One of them, I forget his fucking name, but we got the guy. We, they caught him in like the hills of Mexico yes. last year. Yeah, and so he's free he's, again. Is he free again? Yeah, Here I is, believe he's free he again. He was again ca- captured in July of 22. Yeah, Carol Quintero. Yep. Quintero. And then he was again captured. Okay, yep. so we got him again. Yeah, and he was being, they, they had they did, they did like a press uh, event with him, and he was just kind of like laughing and like mm-hmm. mocking everybody. Mm-hmm. Like, ha, oh, fuck you, I'll be out of here in three months. Yeah. So where's the CIA connection? So, yeah, is there, so, is there so a control find, F that we can find? Find the CIA, CIA guy. You got to you gotta Google who, who oh, is yeah. the CIA officer. Except in Google Chrome. Okay. <laughs> Actually, I think it is still control F in Google Chrome. What I'm were we just talking about? I don't remember. I think we were just talking about conspiracies and how oh, hard yeah. it is to prove a conspiracy right. So essentially, mm. essentially, uh, it would... It, CIA has an entire division focused on countering narcotics. But we counter narcotics that affect American national security priorities. There's all sorts of narcotics out there that don't have any impact on U.S. national security. If they have some other intelligence value, then it basically goes to a panel of people who decide, according to the Washington Post test, whether or not we should get involved in this other type of operation. Mm. Right? Collecting intelligence is not the same thing as stopping criminal activity. Oftentimes, collecting intelligence means, oh, yes. yeah. means accepting or even enabling criminal activity. Right two different things now in a in a post 9-11 world would we run that by fbi yeah we'd be like hey we're thinking about doing something with or against or in conjunction with or that may potentially enable this cartel to operate in a certain way fbi do we have your blessing right nsa can we collect and make sure this is going to work right maybe they even go and they ask the intelligence committee uh, at, at the house what about private intelligence? Do they private intelligence that? is completely different, yeah, right? That's what I it's totally di- private intelligence does whatever it takes to make the paycheck at the end of the day, and that's what makes it so useful. It can move faster, it can move more nimbly, it can absorb risk without ever needing to have like the president have plausible deniability. It's not plausible; he actually has full on deniability. Well, this one definitely does. So yeah, but every <laughs> but every time I hear anybody out there be like, "Oh yeah, a verified like CIA officer did this." Mm, it, it's really hard to verify a CIA officer. And there are so many people out there who claim to be CIA when they're not. They they were uh, they were pulled onto a mission that CIA was part of. Maybe they participated in some private intel effort that was that was uh, unknowingly or knowingly like funded by some third party that may have been affiliated with CIA. Like people throw that term around a lot. Yeah, people really throw no it at idea. you all the time. They try to they try to say like, oh, that Bustamante guy, yeah. not a spy at all. Yeah, or or they yeah they this it's amazing. Or that you've got the people throwing that at me and the people throwing that I'm still actively a spy. Yes, well we know. And I'm are, on podcasts okay. right. trying to recruit more spies. That's not recruiting. You're putting a narrative out. You know, uh, if if the you're truth, a great PR man, the truth is a narrative. Yeah, the truth. <laughs> oh boy, now we're playing with the word truth. Oh my god. Depends on what anyway, anyways, I don't I don't want to spend a whole fucking hour trying to find this guy's name, but there's a documentary about this called The Last Narc. And towards the end of The Last Narc, they actually reveal who the CIA agent was. I think his last name was Rodriguez, and he lives in Miami right now. Okay. And he's retired CIA. Wait, Jose Rodriguez? Yeah. <laughs> Fuck out of here. Yeah, yeah Jose You Rodriguez. know Jose. Uncle yeah, Jose. <laughs> he was the director. He was the uh, chief of- I don't know uh, why. He was the head of the torture. That's how he talks. He's like, we didn't torture anyone. We just made them feel pain. 
It's like, okay. Torture. All right. Cool. Like every conspiracy theory is just intrinsically tied to the CIA. Correct. It yeah. is insane. And you did find a source, one source successfully that talked about this and it's Fox News. Mm, yeah. Let's Yikes. go. Where's the Jerusalem Post? <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> Great with you there, brother. <laughs> I mean, but I actually like what you say about that a lot and people will give you shit for it, but it's a really important point you've made on multiple podcasts where... I think he made it on yours originally at first. I could be wrong about that because you've been on so many fucking podcasts now. Yeah. But thanks to you guys. Oh, I see a new podcast with Andy Bustamante every single week. I was telling Julian the other day. It's wild, man. I've got some recording too in London next week. Oh, really? London. London. Oh. Ooh. Yeah. Tally ho. Anyway. Yeah, yeah. But you were, you've said like with a conspiracy, it's like people, they start with a level of truth, like a kernel of truth. And then they carry it all the way and they want it to be true. Correct. And I agree completely because all the time, you know, we can joke about guy getting drowned in the Puerto Rican pools or whatever. But all the time I'm constantly trying to say, pull things back and be like, well, what's really the evidence for this kind of thing? And people are like, oh, you're a fucking CIA podcast, man. Fuck off. I understand where they could be coming from, though, when when someone like you, like in the CIA or you in the FBI sits there and says, oh, you need to consider that it's just a kernel of truth at the top and eventually gets dragged out because that means, therefore, that yes, there are real conspiracies, but it's a very small percentage of them. So then every time a new conspiracy is faced at the table and you're saying, it, could this be true? You can play the, oh, well, this is part of the big percentage where it's not. And so every time in the law of like populations, large numbers, you're essentially getting to deny it by the same way Dick Cheney did the 1% doctrine because it's like don't focus on the fact that it's only 1% focus on the fact that it could be 1% you're doing the opposite end and saying no 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 it's always the 99 you know what I mean so professional professionals in our field we play probabilities mm -hmm. right and then sometimes probabilities are high enough that they dictate action sometimes probabilities are low enough that they dictate patience right you're, the anatomy of a conspiracy exactly what you're talking about right Every conspiracy starts with a fact. Something mm -hmm. happens. Then, immediately following that fact, we're faced with something that's not known, right? Whether it's, the, wh whether it's what happened with FTX or whether it's what happened with this dude in the Bahamas. We're faced with something that's not known. Once you're faced with something that's not known, the natural human tendency, not among dumbasses, but among smart people, right? Conspiracy theorists are, for the most part, pretty smart mm -hmm. people. Right. The next natural reaction when you're when you're facing unknown information is skepticism, skepticism. You're asking yourself, why don't I know this? Why doesn't somebody know this? Shouldn't somebody know this? Right. Those are the first three steps in the birth of a conspiracy. And then it's human nature that when you are be, when you become skeptical, then you start to write a story in your head that erases the skepticism. You connect the dots on your That's own right. with a piece missing in between. There you mm -hmm. go. The missing link. Yeah. And yep. then it just starts to that's, cycle. That's perfect. And that's because, well explained. And because you're coming up with a logical sound uh, explanation at the end, all the other smart people and all the dumbasses out there, they can connect your story very quickly. So that's how right. conspiracies, boom, take off like wildflower. Mm. And the agency is a, is a nice missing link for a lot of stories. Well, we can never really know about it, but you know, mm -hmm. those guys know right. exactly what happened. Sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. But it still it provides that missing link. It provides that bridge for skepticism to, to rid yourself of that and write your story. What about when something's so obviously backed by something unknown, right? There's people who could define and say, oh, I know this thing is this. And they really have no evidence for that. But you look at something like the Epstein story. We know there's there's a massive conspiracy there. Who's behind it is a whole nother question. But I feel like intelligence organizations perhaps around the world, not focused on the CIA right now, who could have some sort of exposure to that in some way, have every reason to be able to say, oh, no, this guy was just a scumbag doing his thing or whatever. You guys are all conspiracy theorists talking about this. Right. And then they don't report about it in the mainstream media because they're right. all tied to it, by the way. But still. Mm. Right. And and to be fair, before <laughs> before the whole Epstein thing came out, it was like something like we're, we were just looking at and everyone was going, you guys are fucking crazy thinking that, you know, this could be some sort of bigger scheme. And then it all comes out. He gets arrested. And then the fucking book come or not the book. We didn't get the book. But we see we get evidence that, you know, Clinton went down there and all this stuff. And it's like, oh, wow, this did happen. And now we're like, OK, 
But if, if this happens all the time. That's why I always make the joke. I love the joke. What's the difference between a, a conspiracy theory and the truth? Six months. <laughs> so, yeah, the thing to understand is that all covert influence, all covert influence, the United States covert influence, Russian covert influence, Guatemalan covert influence, all covert influence starts with a stigma. Nobody creates a new story out of nowhere. You know how hard it is to get people motivated behind a brand new narrative that's never been said before? It's almost impossible. So you start by targeting an existing issue. You start by targeting an existing stigma. And then you just add fire to that stigma. You want to change, you want to change an election anywhere in South America? You basically just fund <laughs> one side or the other because Listen they're both Listen to the expert funded. people. <laughs> Right. True. Take you know, all laughing aside. Look what happened in 2016, 2020. Look what happened in 2022. Right. You saw all this funding come in for messages on one side or the other. Right. Funding for Facebook, funding for Instagram, all these ads, all these groups. You had FBI and NSA and CIA and the director of counterintelligence for the United States openly telling everybody, be warned. You will see Russian meddling. You will see Chinese meddling. You had the you had the Russian head of propaganda formally announced two days before the election this year. We are Russian. We are taking part in meddling in election. <laughs> they publicly announcing it. We're meddling in the election this year. We're doing it right now. Right. That's you pick a stigma and that's what you fund. That's exactly how covert influence works. Now, does that mean that there are programs in the United States funded by CIA intentionally misdirecting the American people right. that goes against all the authorities, all echoes against everything we were taught. Now, does that mean that the CIA is going to step in and tell CNBC or, or CNN when they're saying something that's wrong? No, they're not going to do that. Perfect example. Uh, if you remember back in like June or July, the death toll for Russian soldiers was something ridiculous, like 80,000, yeah. 80,000 dead Russians, 4,500 dead Ukrainians, as reported by a Ukrainian general. That stuff goes out there, gets approved in the news, goes out. That's all part of a giant war, information war that's happening between NATO countries and Russian countries. That doesn't mean it's coming from the United States. It means that somebody somewhere is providing that information somehow. When the United States uh, uh, head of the Joint Chiefs of Staff finally comes out and comments on the death toll, he did it, what, two days ago? Yeah. What did he say? 100,000 dead on both sides. All that misinformation, eight months of misinformation corrected with one formal statement from the, from the Joint uh, Chief of Staff, right? That's it, 100,000 dead on both sides. That's a crazy number of people, but it sets, it sets a completely new point of view on that conflict. No longer are these Ukrainian soldiers hyper proficient in the Russians' idiots. Instead, you see pretty much a war of attrition between two sides that even with all that Western funding, all that Western intel, all that Western military might, it's still essentially a very close and intimate fight. Mm. Mm. Many so, civilians. Yeah, it's terrible, right? So that that is how information warfare happens. That's how influence campaigns happen. So yes, stigma is everything. Mm. And we garner a ton of great information based on that. We really do. But you don't think they correct the record? Who? Agencies. I'm talking about I'm not talking about CIA. I'm talking about CIA, FBI, NSA. You don't think that you don't think that when these ex CIA guys go on both Fox News and CNN, right? Or they have their guys on each channel, MSNBC, pick them all out. You don't think that there's some correcting the record? Like when I see John Brennan show up on TV, I don't think that guy's doing it cuz he enjoys being a fucking commentator. He's doing it because he's making more money now than he did when he was director CIA. And that absolutely could be part of it. But you don't think right. that he he was a careerist there. Like he was there for a long, long time. You don't think that there's a part of it that could be, you know, tinfoil hat, the guy never leaves? You should. You should. I don't. I don't think people have any idea what happens <laughs> well, when, when you leave government service. That's the other thing. We don't. <laughs> we just don't. Get, we don't. <laughs> remember, men in black Did. goes away. You're at... you. Your most valuable time when you leave service is the first year. Yep. After that, nobody has time for you. It's so hard to remember the stuff that you cover there. Yep. And like clearances and everything else aside, you're just inundated in secrets. And then your brain just doesn't retain them for very long. And the directors 
if you keep in mind this, and Andy's talked about this before, their job is to take what that president wants to get gather information, have their analysts figure out what they need to put into the report in order to deliver it to the executive branch. So there's mm. there's much of that that they have absolutely no idea about. And then let's also keep in mind that what is a what is a senior ranking like government employee make 180k a year when they're active as soon as they retire 60% of their base pay right so they go from $180,000 a year lifestyle to 90 taxed at the regular rate of a $90,000 a year person mm-hmm. so that means all the sacrifice they made in their entire career so that they can make at the end of the day, about $65,000 a year in take-home pay to maintain a lifestyle that they built when they were ge- making $180,000 a year. It's a fundamental flaw in the American system. That's why former yeah. people go into media. That's why Mike Morell has a podcast with CBS. That's why I started a business, right? That's why Jim started a business. Because once you get out of there, you're like, what the hell? Mm-hmm. Like, I Wasn't- built a $200,000 lifestyle, and now the government's got me on a pension paying me, you know, the amount that a starting college graduate makes. Yep. I think you guys talked about this on your podcast, but what did Trump do specifically with people that were hired by the oh, yeah. by the yeah. agencies versus hired by contractors like Honeywell and Raytheon? So this is we might we might not see eye to eye on this. I was actually really happy when Trump went on the hunt to take clearances away from people who were former government officers who just flipped around a rotating door to then go work in Raytheon or Booz Allen or whatever else. They were basically being paid to network their way back into the main building to do business development for those mainstream contractors. So Trump saw that and he was like, you have no reason, you have no need to know at a top secret level. Mm-hmm. So we're just going to take that away. We're just going to take that away. We're going to take that away. We're going to end this because it's they're essentially using that to leverage high paying careers from those companies. Correct. Oh, yeah, correct. Because that's it's a it's a safe way of going from making one hundred eighty thousand dollars a year to making yep. three hundred eighty thousand dollars a year. Yep. And, and just buying- like Jim was saying, that first year is so critical. You actually retain state secrets that are relevant and current mm. for that first year. And then it goes away. Even it's right. They're buying your they're buying your badge. They're right. buying your SEI or whatever you have so that you still maintain access for them, for their benefit. So many, many of many former feds in, in our area go back, rotate back in to the same desk they were sitting at, but working in conjunction with other companies. So basically doing financial analysis to provide the bureau with what they consider Intel, but at the same time, to make sure the company that they're working for gets access to the SAC, to, uh, you know, the unit chief, the section chief. Because you know why? Because the unit chief and section chief control the budget. He's like, yeah, and you know what? I'll I'll be there in four years, so save that seat. So it currently, it currently, the way it currently exists is one year, and then it's and then you lose all of that. One for one for that, and and five for um, being able to to share specific um, experiences. So not. At our discretion. So the Bureau has no issue after four years, you know, five years goes by totally. Now, um, in order to write a book, forget it. I mean, right. it, it's it's a 10-year process. And it's redacted. Mm-hmm. Jack Carr is the perfect example of that. Right. If you listen to his his books, they're they're wonderful. But then at the end of the day, it's like in redacted, in redacted. And then they went redacted. You know, it's constant throughout the Audible book. Yeah, so basically the way the way it works to answer your question, again, in the – in the boring administrative way that it works, the day that you leave service, you're going to leave with most like most likely you're going to leave with a TSSCI, right? I'm guessing FBI is TSSCI, top yep. secret special compartment oh, right. information. You're going to leave with a TSSCI. A year later, that TS drops down to a secret if you're not actively using it in a need to know capacity. A year after that, the secret disappears and you no longer have a clearance. What Raytheon, Booz Allen, Mantech, you name them, what they want is the day you leave, they pick you up. They put you in a role where you have need to know. And now that secret or top secret, that top secret clearance stays active. And even though there's rules at FBI and CIA about you not going back immediately when you, when you separate, that rule doesn't exist when you retire. So then when these senior officials retire, they can go right back into the building. And just like Jim was saying, the contractor is buying the badge. There's no way that individual is going to create $380,000 worth in, in value based on their skill set. 
they're going to create that value because they can go right into any director's office and they can pitch Mantech uh, Mantech systems. They can pitch Raytheon uh, resources. They can pitch new projects. And Mm -hmm. when one of those projects funded for five years becomes a $19 million contract, now all of a sudden they'll pay that retired guy. $380,000 $380,000 for the next five mm-hmm. years. Easy day. Does this exist in other countries the same way it exists here where we have all these military contractors that make all this fucking money doing all this stuff working for the agencies? It's mixed. It's mixed. Here, Depends. Yeah. yeah. Here we're a bull market. So, you know, it exists here because essentially we we encourage business to happen. Uh, Russia and China, no. you're, you're, a, you're an intelligence person for life. Yep. It doesn't matter if you get in or get out. Like mm-hmm. you're always going to get paid on the government salary. Israel's different. Definitely. Um, I want to say Colombia is different. Yep. I think some South American countries. Australia. Um, Australia, definitely. Canada. Canada to an extent. Yeah, it's it's a, you'll see folks that still need the safety net and, and you know, God bless them. They're, they're good people. But um, what we do is you don't have to deal with, it, you still have to deal with all the bullshit. Even if you keep the badge, when you go back into the building, it's still requirements, polygraphs, everything else yep. that comes along with that. Um, and guys love it because, like you know, Andy said, they're, they've never had a chance to pay for kids' college until they get that job. Yep. A lot of right. incentives you'll hear, all right, base salary is this, but we'll take care of your kids' tuition. Mm-hmm. That kind of stuff. So the that's government, the important. Government, government doesn't take care of its lifetime no. public servants. Nope. You, I mean, just if you, if anybody listening right now who's been medically retired, who's retired from the military, oh, yeah. who's retired from public service in any way, they'll tell you straight. They're nodding their head as they listen to this. Yep. Government does not take care. You got to rebuild your entire life on a budget the day you retire from government service. It is so true. And you spend a, lo- most, a lot of your time in government service, not a lot, but th- there's, there's segments during the year, every year. Where you sit and you go, all right, you know what? If I stay an extra five years, and I know there's buddies of mine that are listening. If I stay an extra five, that's 2%. (laughs) But then, guys, think about it. You know, think about it. 2% of 170, you know, is it worth the next five years of your life? I don't think so. We can jump out now. $30,000. That's it. You know, for me, I mean, I I came out with a a decent pension payment, but it's certainly not something I could live on if I couldn't sustain the life that I want to live and give to my kids and give to my marriage. And I couldn't do that without going back to work. You know, meanwhile, it's impossible. Spend, meanwhile, we spent what, like, I think it was $10 billion was spent on the advertising for midterm elections. Yep. 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 It's yeah. It's fucking insane. Yep. With all the other shit, we could spend $10 billion on 34 years of my life for what, what I got. Now I, I, I don't, regret a single yep. thing that i did it's because you're a servant yep i want to do it i'm a gut you know i'm a servant leader and that's how i consider myself but really you know well that's the problem governments have to compete against private markets that have i mean this is where capitalism incentivizes so when you're you use the example of russia and china we all know they're author one's right one's left but they're authoritarian governments and they get to say what goes and that's that it's not like you know, there's a free market system. So, and there's skills, Julian, you make great sense because there, mm-hmm. there's, there's skills that we hire for. Um, and people know people that know what those skills are tend to make a serious amount of money, but their shelf life is so short. Yeah. Um, because you know, why would you stay in a government where you're getting polygraphed government job when you can go off to the next private company and do your thing probably at three X and never get questioned about what you're doing in your personal or right. private life, right? So mm-hmm. still, still like, you know, th- there's still lifestyle questions on the fucking polygraph. Yeah. <laughs> in the FBI, in the in the agency, there's still lifestyle questions. It's amazing that this polygraph is me? still a thing. Yeah. The poly- and, it, and it's yeah. tough. And those, and, and they're trained, they're trained guys like us, but, but they're not as experienced as most in the, in private sector are. So, you know, I can I can pass today and fail tomorrow on the same question. Right. And and you you'd look at the person and say, hey, didn't we didn't we border this? Yeah. Didn't we parameterize this? Yep. Yeah, I did, but you came up uh, you know, deceptive. You but, but two weeks ago I didn't. <laughs> so so it, it has have I changed? Have I killed somebody in the last two weeks? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> But from, it, from a distance. From, yeah. Well, I, I thought, thought about it. Jim went I to a country and he's not allowed to come back now. Well, that's what happened. Yeah. But I mean, like, that's, that's, <laughs> Greece. Ter- that's terrible. Yeah, right. That's terrible, though, to have to not be able to. Why would you stay? Yeah. Why would your shelf life be any longer than, you know, learn the skill, make the contacts, get the badge, 
I don't off. know. I don't know if FBI is going through this, but CIA has been going through a massive attrition for the last five or seven years. It can't hire people fast enough. It's got massive, uh, massive gaps in in critical hiring capacities mm. because people are waking up. Younger generations are waking up to exactly what Jim's saying. So all the normal retirement is happening. All the mid-career people are asking themselves, do I really want to stay for another 15 years or do I want to bail now as a mid-careerist? And mm. then all of the junior officers have been through a tour or two and they're like, you know what? This government thing isn't all that great and I'm still 32 years old. I could make a 30-year career in the commercial sector. Not to mention all the contractors out there who serve the government are still thinking, hungry for those clearances. Yeah. Right? And you said that's where all the leaks come from, too. Not, that's where we have all the It's not problems. where all the leaks come from. A the place of. where the leaks come from is exactly what we're talking about. Government hasn't right-sized the initiatives or the incentives right. for people who have secrets. Yep. So, I mean, CIA had three, three arrests of former CIA officers in 2021. Think about that. How Wait, who are working on the private side now no so some were some were oh. contractors some were actively involved in at cia mm. the we just it's had an, we saying. just had an arrest this week of a of a couple that, that was selling secrets about navy navy uh, military vessels to the chinese mm. just to, that was just really? just mm. sentenced this week right like we in the intel game on the counter intel game specifically where we're trying to catch people who are spies against our country like we're getting taken to lunch mm. We're 20 years behind global global war on terror, right? Yeah. How, how like, in your head, when you're looking at our government and powerful positions, could be bureaucratically or in an official elected capacity in the government, do you think at all times, well, it's definitely at all times, but do you think there is much more than past the puke button of people who are working in government who are on the take for other governments and working in an intelligence manner so my my personal opinion is is grown largely from what we were taught at the agency and at the agency we were taught just assume there's moles mm. assume you're penetrated assume that there's information being leaked out that you can't control right. leaked out to foreign governments leaked out through anonymous sources to the press just assume that there's a big leaky bucket and operate operate anyways that's that's how i was taught so that's kind of how i assume it, of it right i think that's past the puke button personally but that's what professionals were trained to do yeah and from my standpoint just looking at the bureau's public corruption program and the amount of money and attention that has gone into that over the over the entire course of my career um i look and say uh yeah i mean it doesn't matter appointed elected um yeah. you know they are going to they are going to benefit. Some of them walk right on the line. Some of them jump over the line. And some of them live their life in the gray area. But they're all fucking benefiting. And then ASAC Schrader knocks on their door. And right. It's all, uh, <laughs> right. You don't, add, you know, listen, you don't, you don't live that lifestyle that we see most of our elected officials that are in the public space on one, that 172. That, that, that's the same money. That's it. That's the money. Yeah. It's just, it's just, you know. Source and application work, yeah. man. It's what we do. Here's what you make. Here's what you're spending. All right. Where's the difference? You know, I don't I don't have any difference in mine. When he's talking but, about checks, when he's talking about money, what he means is you follow the money. And where there's a gap in the money, that's where you know to focus your resources. Somebody's living a $100,000 a year lifestyle, they get $60,000 a year, there's a gap. Somebody's Somebody else is living a $60,000 a year lifestyle, they make $80,000 a year, there's no gap there. Mm-hmm. So how do you prioritize your investigative resources? You dig into the guy that somehow is coming up with 40K extra a year. The little girl in the red coat in that way. Correct. That's exactly right. You know, and you look at like, even from my experience, it's it's so egregious when you get to the to most of these people that you know are living that lifestyle. It's, it's 10X. It's 20X. So it, they don't even give a shit. Yep. You know, they don't give a shit. They'll, they'll bargain out. They'll plea bargain out, spend their four years in jail in a federal camp and come back and have shit hidden somewhere else. Still yeah. have the same relationships going yeah. on. You're not going to, you know, not, now what scares the shit out of them is the IRS. Yeah, that's true. Because <laughs> guess what the IRS does? Right. It just sniffs out money. Yes. They just take it all. Everything you do. I mean, IRS agents are going to, especially the, on the 1811 side, which is the actual criminal investigators, mm -hmm. they're going to follow your ass in. If you're, if you're a politician, that's, we said, that's a 10Xer, they're following your ass everywhere you go. 
Did he pay cash? They'll, I mean, they'll walk right up. I've, I've seen, I think I've talked about cases where I've seen IRS agents walk up to cash registers at restaurants <laughs> and say, how do you just pay? <laughs> and, the guy, and the guy's right yeah. there. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and, you said you, know, you did that a couple times. Yeah, too, I did it one record. guy. Yeah. yeah, that was fun. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I know the IRS agent was fun to be MOs, with, but, <laughs> MOs, completely yeah. different MOs. Didn't yeah, something yeah. recently change with the IRS? Didn't they just get they some sort of new? Yeah, like, they hired eighty-seven thousand folks who won't be trained until two thousand forty-six. Well, there's it's more. Just ridiculous. This is what? like stupid. An, this I didn't is, hear about this. This is an unknown stupid. fact, though. That was crazy. Did you see but, some of the hirings though? Some of the people, some of the demographics of the hirings. No. I mean, nothing against educate, you know, educated, un- it doesn't matter. But these are not the best and the bright. These are the people that couldn't get in the military. They didn't want to go in the military. Mm, Seriously. Really? That's what it is. Think about it. I mean, we just talked. How, how do you not work through? You You are 25,000 short nationally on your arm. This is just one branch. This is the Army's recruiting. 25,000 mm. short. But yet, those people that you said, no, we can't really deal with what you did here or whatever. IRS is picking them up. Because who the fuck wants to be an IRS agent? Right. There's like, you walk into a bar, you tell and, and a chick, I'm an even, IRS agent, the, like, these she's are, out of there. These are auditors. These aren't they, even agents. They these can carry guns, right? The 1811s can. So the criminal investigators can. That's what... But the, but the OIG side, they're they're doing audits. But, you know, listen, you if you jumped on a call with LegalZoom right now and said, hey, um, I'm an S corporation, you know what they're going to tell you? Oh, that never gets audited. So I said I had I'm a guy. I'm an S corporation too. Never gets audited. So so the guy goes. To, well, now we're gonna get audited. But, uh, <laughs> but sorry, you're Damn the first. It, you're the first phone call I'm sorry. making, Jim. All right, it's done. <laughs> uh, but honestly, like that, Legal Zoom is telling you, giving you, providing you that information, and the fact that you have to hire eighty seven thousand people means you are so far behind that I'll be dead and buried before somebody comes and you know knocks on my door and says, Hey, what was that? Hey, you went down to, to concrete, you know, and you wrote that off. You know, I'm like, yeah, that was Danny. He told me to do it. Yeah. Um, when we're, when we're smoking a hookah. <laughs> no, I'm going to kid. No, but there's like the in all seriousness with the IRS, though, there are some some guys there who are legit and they're not oh. you're they're not fo- they're not just like falling for your taxes and stuff. Andy Greenberg, who I'm having back in, who we've talked about before. He, his whole last book that is now coming out, I guess it'll be out like when this episode comes out in a couple of days, but like his whole last book is basically on the biggest dark web stories of the past 10 years that he was a part of the reporting on. Like Andy was an early guy on the Silk Road story. He interviewed Ross Holbrook when he was still DPR behind a keyboard before anyone else did. And he works his way through like Alpha Bay up to even like some of the crazy like child porn cases that they were able to trace. And the stars of the book are IRS agents. And these are dudes going around the world with guns on their fucking hips getting some of the biggest organizations and, and taking them down. Now, Silk Road's like kind of a different one for people, but if you look at some of these other like straight up evil ones that they took down, it's there's other agencies involved, but like there's some badass guys who figured this shit out. I, I got to give greatest, it to them. Greatest leverage in the world is having an IRS agent, you know, criminal investigator on your team when you're doing a search warrant. You know, just authorities. they don't want to talk Remember to we were us. talking about authorities? Yeah. yeah. IRS it, can look into something nobody else can look into. That's exactly it. Sometimes they just, oh. How you do know. you explain Scientology? Oh, yeah. That's a I mean, great is that, question. Is that an open-ended question? Because I don't have an answer <laughs> to any of that. Yeah. <laughs> the story the of Scientology. Right are you familiar with how Scientology became a religion, like, officially? I just uh, know Tom Cruise is nuts. <clears throat> I mean, that's all I'll say. They wanted to become Where's a Shelley? religion. <laughs> Where is she? They wanted, they wanted to become a religion so bad, they... Basically, the the leader of Scientology, whose name is L. Uh, Ron Hubbard, is yeah. that the guy? David Miscavige. Okay. L. Ron Hubbard started Founder. it. He was a sign. He was a uh, a science fiction writer. He okay. founded it. Okay. And then David Miscavige took over. And L. Ron Hubbard's dying wish was for Scientology to become a religion, so they wouldn't be able to pay tax. Wouldn't have to pay taxes. <laughs> oh man! So what they did was they had literally, I think it was tens of thousands of their members all file lawsuits against the IRS. And eventually they won. The IRS fucking waved the white flag and said, okay, you guys can become a religion. You guys oh are tax free. That's all it takes? That's awesome. Wow. That's a good strategy. <laughs> I'm going to plug that one back in the memory yeah. bank for later fucking on. Fucking wild. What do we want, do we want, to, what do we want to call ours? There's a documentary about it. It's <laughs> exactly fascinating. <laughs> <laughs> mm. The documentary is called uh, Going Clear yeah. um, The Prison of Belief. 
and basically That's how they amazing. just brainwash all these people into Scientology and they convince them to do whatever they want. Basically, they start out by feeding you. In sci- I'm, I don't know if you're familiar with Scientology, how it works, but they, they feed you all these uh, these life hacks in the beginning on how to better your life, how to push out all the negative, influence in your, negative influences in your life and how to become the best version of yourself, mm. like Tony Robbins type shit. Mm. And then once you get into it and you start paying the money, then they start letting you into some of the fucking Xenu alien galactic overlord shit. And uh, you have to graduate. You have it's to graduate wild. To that. <laughs> My one friend went and tried out for Scientology. Tried, so tried out. Tried out. Did it's he like, really? Yeah, I really need some help. And they're like, oh, Michael, you're you're really fucked up. And he failed like the whole test they give you. And he's like, oh, this is, this is some crazy oh, shit. I'm man. out of here. Did he really? He wasn't serious. Like he just, he wanted to go there just to see like, if he could see into the cult. Well, the fucking, the headquarters of where it all started is less than 15 miles yeah. from where we are. Yeah, right? It's a beautiful headquarters. It's insane. Where, where, what town? Clearwater. 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 Downtown Clearwater. Who's, that's who's the, the guy you had on? Mike, Mike Rittler? Mike Rittler? If you, see, Rittler you, see, Rittler Rittler. Shit? If you see the brick buildings in Clearwater? Yeah. All that old historic refurbished districts? It's all science. Tom Cruise is it's in called there the flag. Fucking... It's called the flag building. And the inside of it is literally plated in marble and gold. Oh it looks like gosh. the inside of Trump's fucking Holy penthouse. Yeah. Oh, yo, yo. <laughs> it's insane. And all those <laughs> guys, really? Tom Cruise and John Travolta, they both have condos in downtown Clearwater somewhere. And there's like, it's so many fucking, some of the wealthiest people in Clearwater are a part, are a part, of, part of Scientology. Wow. Like if you look at all the oh, yeah. waterfront homes in Tax Clearwater. Abatements. Of course they are. It's 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 kind of creepy, man. Economics, right. man. Just like we've that's been our saying. next. That's our next uh, mission. They're we either figure out what our what our religion is going to look like. My accountant. Well, what about like? It, and that's actually a really good topic. I don't know if I've talked with either of you what guys our about this. What our no, 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 like? no, 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 no. I'm saying like when you look at the world and conflicts and and playing into cultures, every war and not let me correct that. A lot of wars tie back to like certain people at the top of a structure bastardizing like the religious beliefs or and that could even by the way i'm including like the religious belief of the state here like you look at the soviet union what was their religion you worship the fucking hammer and sickle and everything and so when 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 you're working in the symbol of democracy like america where it's supposed to be freedom of religion freedom of speech freedom of all that and you're evaluating other countries where that doesn't exist do you find that the people who are on our end evaluating that, who literally haven't been to those places, have no ability to actually add something to the conversation? Yes and no, I would say. So part part of what you're talking about is is uh, cultural sensitivity yes. or cultural acuity. Uh, but another part of what you're saying is also understanding the foundational ideology of a yes. culture. It goes way deeper than religion. It goes, I mean, you got to look at how they're raised. You got to look at what their life experience was like from their core years from one to five and then their core adolescence from 13 to 21. These are when all people are shaped. It's when yes. your, your brain is conditioned. So for sure, people who are culturally acute are can offer some amazing insights. Um, but that doesn't necessarily mean the people who aren't culturally acute are worthless. What actually ends up happening is sometimes the best ideas come because a culturally ignorant mm. person proposes something that is so outlandish to the culturally acute person that they would have never even considered it. And then all of a sudden you've got this innovative idea. That's what I've seen. That's how I've seen mm. it play out. I like that. Yeah, I like that. I mean, in my in my world, military world was basically that, you know, looking at a culture, looking at all parts of that culture to include, um, you know, like Andy said, their upbringing, their, their particular methods of doing things that are different than any place else for the most part and then trying to kind of find ways to to incentivize that but you're under like for example though your undercover work in the fbi when you did that was very different as you've told me correct me if i'm wrong than your undercover work in the army because as you put it i think in the army the end goal was they're gone Right. Whereas in in the FBI, you're trying to get information to make a case and whatever. So what are you re- like but when you're you, going undercover with, it's with less like about the, under like, yes, you're, you're absolutely right on that side. But what I'm saying is in my actual military position and job as a civil affairs officer, mm, you're okay. trying to understand okay. and how to incentivize that person or that culture or those people to, in fact, help. Right. For a particular and have them believe that they're helping for their particular good. 
Because if mm. they don't help you, they become hostile to you. 100%. And this. you don't, it's much easier to have 15 people fighting for you than coming up with 15 people who have to neutralize 15 people before the battle can even start. Right. That's right. And a lot of it, incentive, you know, think about it. Incentive sometimes is just this, just yeah. cash. Problem with that is, um, you start seeing those people picked off slowly over time. Because they can be bought out by someone else. And mm -hmm. that's it. So they go away. So we had to be really careful. And then there was a whole deal with, um, you know, corruption within our military of realizing getting down and out about the fact that, you know, we're paying these people, they're providing information, then they're gone. Yep. Mm -hmm. What are you guys doing about it? So, you know what? Fuck you. I'm taking the money. And that happened. That was a mindset that happened. So we had go go forward a few That's years, and I had cases that actually came from that people. And you would talk to these people, and they would say, "Yeah, I'm. I'm. There's no way I'm going to participate in their death." So you stole money. Is that what it is? No, I didn't. I just I diverted it so people wouldn't get killed, and they believed that. Well, they convinced them. You're saying they convinced themselves uh, yeah, to believe that more than anything. Of course, uh, yeah. we all do that. We all yeah. rationalize yes. our beliefs. Yes, yes, but yeah, to your point, there's. When it comes to the benefit of it's all a it's all a cost benefit analysis. How much time and energy should go into understanding someone's ideological background and what's the benefit you get out of it? Jim and I come from a world where benefit to the United States is everything. Mm -hmm. If it doesn't benefit us, then we don't really waste our time on it. And I think the reason that we've been successful in business outside of government is because we approach it the same way. What's the benefit to us? What's the service that we can provide? And if we if there's a is there's a positive a net sum win there, then we execute. If it's net yes. neutral or net loss, we're not going to waste our time. So many people out there, our culture, talk about cultural ideology, our culture in the United States has somehow turned into somebody else needs to do it for me. Mm -hmm. mm. It's somebody else's responsibility mm -hmm. to teach my children. It's somebody else's responsibility to keep my neighborhood safe. It's somebody else's responsibility to give me a job. It's somebody else's responsibility to determine if my skill sets warrant a college degree. We've outsourced every, uh, every so thought. much of our life. We've yep. outsourced to somebody else's systematic structure of approval. And who defines that systematic structure of approval? The state. Mm. Not the state of Florida, but the nation state of the United States. Amen on that. So I when you totally agree. So when you're up against that kind of like that kind of uh, enemy, like, honestly, sometimes the best thing to do is just to work outside of the system, which is why that's how we've chosen to operate. We work outside mm. of the system. Because then the system doesn't really know what to do with us. And most of the clients that meet us are like, you guys are outside of the system. We're like, yeah, we can do pretty much anything you want to have happen. We can find a creative way to make it work. But what if the same True. people who are perhaps funding you to do that are also funding the system itself? Isn't it just a never-ending closed circle? It does it? Here's, here's where I get cutthroat. Do we benefit? Does the client benefit? End of story. That's it. You know, and, and the one th the, the thing I learned, I've learned a lot from Andy, and these, it's only been, you know, what? Yeah, you guys are seven working together. We know each, but yeah. money is but, the but, ultimate religion. But, but <laughs> the thing that, the, the thing that impressed me so much and that has changed my style of doing business and what he does really well is his one thing. So, what he does is training, and that's his one thing. And he's able to look outside of anything else. And say no, I'm I'm really sorry. You know, I never could do that. As as we know here, it right. would be like, yeah, I definitely can do that. And I definitely. And then I found myself in a position where I couldn't, not because I wasn't capable, because I didn't have time, and I didn't want to get outside of the realm of just the one guy. So, watching Andy operate, and we sat last summer, yep. uh, you know, and and just listening to him, I've been able to one thing it, and you know how difficult that has been for me. Yeah. And man, oh man, <laughs> right. All I'll say is it's taken off. You know, where he's the training person and he does it and what we witnessed last night you know how well he does it and how thorough and how um servant leadership oriented he is my assessment work has just been a blessing i simplified to the point where we can do it now you can't do that in a government organization you can't right. one thing it even if you're in even if you're in a certain you know if if you're in in one area of the world or another you still have many yep. responsibilities. Even, even if, if you're, you're talented, one even if you're super talented at one thing, when, you're going to get you never you're going to get moved around. Now they'll pigeonhole you in shit that's meaningless. <laughs> they will do that, so you got to watch out. <laughs> well, they do that. You got to be why, careful. Why is that though? Uh, because it, it's easy. Because there's no issues with that one thing. Uh, put you know what? Put this guy. He's going to do all our cart, all our computer you know yeah. work. Yeah. Put him over there. He won't he won't say anything. In the meantime, the dude's burnt out. He's miserable. He's been divorced twice. But you know what? There's never a problem that comes with the computer systems here. 
ever. We never have an issue. And I, I was guilty of that probably a bunch until I started to realize what's going on with so-and-so he's miserable. So what my point is the one thing is, is your detriment sometimes in the bureau, but also the fact that you cannot choose your one thing and move forward with it is the biggest distraction. It's the shiny nickels. I want to be, you're either going to be a guy who wants to be on the, the headlines or you're going to be a guy that's actually going to get things done. We have too many headline folks at the bureau right now. Too many people looking for, oh, I got to be this and that. And you see what's happening. You yeah. see the press we're getting. And rightfully so, we're getting it. So, so yeah, we, I think Jim and I are no, we're not naive to corruption. We're not naive to conspiracy. We're not naive to the fact that the system is built for the preservation of the state, not the preservation of the people. We're not naive to any of that. But we also realize that our sphere of influence doesn't bleed into that. And I'm not going to spend my my chance to create a legacy for my family, I'm not going to spend that spinning wheels trying to reshape the world, mm -hmm. trying to reshape the country that has formed the way that it has formed because of the foundation that we've been formed on. We, it's, we're a giant battleship. We turn, our country takes changes. It turns, it evolves. But those evolutions are really slow. I'm not going to be the one that spins my wheels trying to turn it. And I think what we've discovered in business especially is that when you're... Depending on how you shape a business, it can be a freaking sports car. Speed up, slow down, mm. turn on a dime, you know, take off. Or you can spend your time trying to build a giant warship or a cruise ship. You spend 10 years building it and then it still doesn't turn very well. Mm. Right. It's, and that's just not the world that I'm that I'm part of. Right. I'll, I'll End talk up like about John Karyaku. <laughs> yeah. I'll talk about anything that folks want to talk about. If I can contribute, if I can collaborate, I absolutely want to contribute and collaborate. Mm -hmm. But the truth is I don't get, I go to sleep at night just fine with the fact that our country's in some kind of decline right now. I can't fix it. Yeah. You speak really bluntly about that. And I actually, that's one thing that I think it almost like the people, all the same people who call you out for still being active CIA or not a real spy <laughs> or something. They then hear that and they're like, Oh, well, well right. Think yeah. Of that. Well, giving up control. I mean, we, we have, we have lived a life of control yep. from our service Academy days through our service, through, you know, our, our time in, in the government. And it's so, it's so nice to give up that control in many ways in your life and, yeah. you know, not to get spiritual or whatever, give up control and everything seems to fall into place. Right. We're not, we weren't built for that, but no. we're able to do it. I find the, the best part of this whole conversation is that an Air Force and an Army guy are using Navy, you know, kind of ships <laughs> to, 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 move, to explain our points. It's because the up. only place we can find like, real God, inefficiency, the place we can, we can find real inefficiency is the Navy. <laughs> I had a guy in here uh, last week who was a Harvard scientist. He had a, a master's degree from Harvard, a uh, doctorate, I think, from MIT, mm. and he was hired by uh, DARPA. He was part of a headhunting thing, and he got picked to work with DARPA to develop all kinds of weapons that he said he couldn't talk about a lot of them, but he could talk about some of them. And he was talking about a lot about he's made this, his life's mission is to help people with this directed energy brain, brain problems people are having, which is quote unquote Havana syndrome. Havana syndrome and yeah. I try to research it. I try to like actually do like a, a, a two day deep dive on it and it's split down the middle. There's so many people online that say that these are just crazy people. Like these people are, are like that worked in the embassy in Cuba, like conveniently had a headache and a hangover. And now they want to try to take all this, you know, this, these benefits claiming they have some sort of fucking covert CIA weaponization thing that happened to them from either the Russians or f whether it was our weapons or Russia's weapons. And they say, they claim it's just, you know, like woo woo conspiracy shit. And then there's a whole nother group of actual like former officers of CIA or FBI. There's actually an article that just came out last week of an FBI agent in, I sent you this art article, the FBI, the new FBI bureau in Miami. Mm -hmm. um, one of the guys there just got diagnosed with quote unquote Havana. I forget what mm. the actual medical term is directed energy. Do you have any experience or knowledge of anything like this? So I know, I know directed energy weapons are real. They're, they're very real. They've been experimented for a long time. They're fraught with issues because our technology isn't good enough to be able to hone the directed energy. So it's dispersed and it's uh, unpredictable and it's unreliable. So for sure, directed energy weapons are something microwave energy weapons and and other types of directed energy weapons are have for a long time been real. 
Now, whether or not they're what's causing Havana syndrome, that's the real question that people have. Have they been actively weaponized and deployed into the field? For me, I've got peers and people that I trust at CIA who are claiming these symptoms and they have no reason. There's no win for them. Like you guys don't know the culture at CIA. The culture at CIA is you don't walk around claiming that you're hurt with a headache. Mm -hmm. it, it, that's not you're not a warrior if you walk around just complaining about a headache or mm -hmm. if you try to fake that you have a bad knee or something like that. Like the culture is hardcore. The culture is anything that is required to keep America safe, we will do and we will bear it as silent sentinels. That's the culture. So if, if there are people at CIA saying that they have this common symptom, I believe them. And I know that all, I know that energy directed weapons are real. I trust the people at CIA who are saying they have symptoms. I'm going to say there's a guy who has graduated Harvard with multiple degrees who's saying that they're real and he's dedicating his life to solving the problem. I'm going to say it's real. I'm going to say the idiots on the Internet who have an opinion about how it's not real. They don't have a stake in the game. So from my point that's of view, right. they can go to hell. The people who have a stake in the game, that's where I'm going to gamble. He's also saying he's interviewed over 2,000 civilians who claim the same exact symptoms. Which civilians would make sense, in the U.S. Which would make sense if it was truly a direct energy weapon because they can't be controlled and directed. So mm. you've got all sorts of bleed over and all sorts of collateral damage. Oh I, I just, God. you speak, brother. I, I mean, I, I don't have personal experience with knowing folks. I'd love to see who the Miami agent is because I know that office pretty well. I, I texted you the link I'm wondering earlier. if they, oh, okay. were, the, were these folks that had it happen in Miami or were they over this is the a Gitmo? This or? is the article right here. Go back to the top. Is that one of them? No, this is not. This is not the right one. I got to text you the right one. This but is, this one came out a week ago. I, I'm with Andy on the side of you know if, if they exist and we know they do and we have somebody that's confirming that who's educated and we have people within the organizations that we work for. Uh, I've I mean, there's guys that are dying from the pile, and they're not making it up. Yeah. You know what I mean? So yeah. I look at it and say, hey, look, it, and it's not. It's not. Listen. There's no benefit of getting medically yeah. <laughs> medically retired. Yeah. No. I'm telling you, there's no yes, benefit. You're miserable. And you just, I, I know one or two people who have done it. They're miserable, miserable people because they want to be back in the fight. But the government now, because you brought it up, government saying, sorry, yeah. you know, you got, you, you can't do it. Anybody you know? out there saying that it's easy to get medical benefits from the government oh. is oh, clearly yeah. completely Crazy. ignorant to what it's like to get medical benefits yeah. from the government. Right, here we go. This is, this is the article. Okay. Florida Let's case of Panama. More than 1,000 U.S. government employees and their families mm. say they're experiencing yep. severe headaches, mental disorientation because of something called Havana syndrome. Mm. Okay, this is like a 60 minutes. Let's keep scrolling. Yeah, so I guess there's like some sort of... Rubio so comment. the FBI won't talk about it. Like, I guess they reached out to the Bureau to get some sort of official comment on it, and no one will comment on it. Well, that okay. doesn't mean anything. It's just a, they're saying it's a quote-unquote cover-up. Yeah, of course they're saying it's a cover-up. If you send a media inquiry to CIA or NSA or FBI... It better be something extremely important and relevant yes. to their normal line of work if you expect the, the one or two public affairs officers to right. find that one require that one request out of the ten thousand they got that day mm -hmm. and make and take the time to respond to it. Right. Or no, if it's no a, comment is literally just no comment. And it's also gotta be like I totally understand why there's things not in your interest to do it. Right? Like the last thing you need, and this even applies to the FBI because there's plenty of, you know, covert level things that have to happen there from like a policing perspective. The last thing you need is to put information that can be used out there. So I, I don't I almost don't understand. Like you had the one guy in, right, Tom O'Neill, right? The yeah. dude who wrote the who yeah, wrote yeah. the Manson book. Mm -hmm. He broke it down perfectly because he went. He went to the uh, chaos, I, chaos. Chaos. Yes. Yes. That's, yes. That's a great, it's right it's a great oh, yeah. read, man. Right on, I connected on, Charles Manson to great, MKUltra. Great read. He hmm. went through the story perfectly about how I think it was with the Washington Post. They were insisting that like their CIA sources were perfect. They said, okay. And he had the he had the actual like information that they were going to be looking for. So he said, I'll tell you what, I'll bring it down. Let's get them on the phone. Let's see what they say. And so they get them on the phone. They're like, hey, Tom, how are you? Like going back and forth like it's every week. Or Jim, we'll call him whatever. And so Tom O'Neill sitting in the room with the documents. And the reporter asks, or the editor, I think it was, asked the 
the CIA guys about this information that's literally sitting right in front of them to to comment on it and describe like what they know. And they say, oh, yeah, we know all about that. And they proceed to lie their ass off and say the opposite of what's on that page. And when you hear that story, you're like, oh, wow, what scumbags, whatever. But at the same time, I do recognize that like whatever was on that page is not in their interest to be able to like get the story to the media so that the media can tell people and distract them from doing their job, which is a slippery slope. Let's be honest. Yeah. It, it could be. But at the same time, like I don't – like the CIA especially is a spy organization. I expect them to be spies, mm. right? Like I don't expect them to be out here doing podcasts, though you're doing a great job on behalf. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's not like – He won't leave that alone. Yeah, I, I'll never leave that alone. <laughs> I'll never leave that alone. I believe in that one. Sorry. But you know what I mean? Like I it's do. not. It's not – and I get that. It's not in your I interest do. to no. say that. So even with a story like this, you guys – may very well be working on all this right now but you're not going to be like yeah no it's totally real they're attacking us no. every day no it doesn't benefit it doesn't benefit the people who are doing the work it doesn't benefit the victims it doesn't benefit the scientists right the the truth the truth is that the truth very often doesn't benefit the public mm -hmm. and the public doesn't like to hear that yep. no, right no. the truth is that the truth does not often benefit the public so what's the point in telling the public the truth just because they feel like they're entitled to the truth, if they feel entitled to the truth, they can go apply for a job at FBI. That's right. They can go apply for They can go enlist in the military and they can learn all the truth they want to learn. There you go. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but right? how does that erode at the trust of government and erode at the civilization or not just the civilization, but erode at the fucking the, the nation? The government the doesn't care. The, nation. Yeah. <laughs> the government doesn't the, care. Do, do, they not, gonna, do they not care? They don't care, right? They don't care. They don't. They don't the, does it erode at the trust? They don't care. Yeah. The government doesn't benefit from trust in government. The government benefits from obedience and civil order. If the day came that distrust and in that's government. That's how you get fucking January, whatever. What was yeah. the date they fucking January stole? 6th. The, January yeah. 6th. Yeah. So the, the point is that we have created, our forefathers created a government in the United States that was designed to protect this perfect union. Not all of the people within this perfect union. As long as the union is secure, then it can operate to serve the benefit of the people, even the people who don't like or trust the government, right? So who, do we, who does the government prioritize? It prioritizes the person engaged in civil governance. The people who vote get a say. The people who pay taxes get a say. The people who want to run for office and become elected, they all get a say. So if you engage and participate, then the government does, in fact, serve you. But if you sit around and you throw pot shots and you bitch, government already knows you're going to be perfectly content with your working water, your working sewage, your working mm. electrical lines, your local police force, your public school. <laughs> Here's the scary thing. Look at you chuckling. If you look, <laughs> so true. <laughs> if you look at media and the evolution of media, it's moving away from the people that are in control of pushing the narratives. It's going more into the hands of independent creators who can speak their minds and speak freely and to have conversations like this and talk about all the fucking deception and all the lies and all the dark, sinister things that the government has done. And when it starts to go more and more that way, well, the problem is they're financially incentivized to do that more. And that voice becomes bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And now that's directly in conflict with the government. What happens after that? Mm. It, it is, but you're giving Great people question. what they crave. Yeah. You know, we, we can't do that as government servants. Yep. I can't sit and talk to somebody about what they crave, what they really want to know. Oh man, was there anything? And, and it's, it's cliche for us when we say we really can't talk about it, but sometimes we really can't talk about it. You know, it's, it's our livelihood and our well-being that goes on the line. Should we do that? Mm -hmm. But what you guys are doing, which I think is beautiful and it's, it's, it's the next level of where we should be going for independent. There's no independent thinkers until these things came along. Right. So right. people are never really investigating their own mind and saying, what do I really think about that? And why now you're showing the structure for how to do that with guests, but what you're doing together, what you're doing separately, what other people are doing, there's, there are not a lot of independent thinkers. And I'm talking very well-educated people who the last thing they watched or saw is their opinion. Have you ever heard of the 80-20 rule? Yeah, yeah. Yes, I love that. Of course. Yeah. The yep. 80, so the 80-20 rule applies to everything. It's mathematically yes. sound. So mm -hmm. that means it applies to all of this independent media that you're talking about. Yes. Of the 100% of people who are listening to this conversation right now, 20% of them will learn something new and take action. 80% of them aren't even paying attention right now. Mm -hmm. Maybe they're looking at the screen right now because I just called them out for not paying attention. <laughs> right. But 80% of them aren't paying attention. Mm -hmm. We are not here to talk to the 80%.
you're not doing this work every day to talk to the 80%. We are all talking to the 20%. Mm -hmm. And then if you look at just the 20% of the 20% that listen and learn something new of that group, only 20% will take action. The other 80% will be satisfied with the fact that they learned one new thing. But it's also the 20% controlling the conversation too, because the 20% who yell out the fucking loudest and scream at each other get all the attention. And so then the 20% who actually are paying attention get pissed at them because they're in the 80% that doesn't want to do that. And it's an, it, that's another never-ending circle yeah. right there too. Yeah, but I think what you think what the value is here is the, the, the yeah. thought and the idea of independent yep. thinking. We need more of that. We don't have that. Look at... You know, I, I'm not picking on a generation, but this this tells them all they need to know. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. In their mind. The now, we know that's not the case. Right. We know the case that you should really look into things that bother you. Look into things that interest you. And like Andy said, find your one thing. Pursue it with full, you know, full, foot down on the pedal and learn from that and experience the independent thinking, which is, uh, again, it's a, it's a control thing. Lose control. Let yourself do it. It's almost you know? like, yeah, to, to look at the control point a different way, we, we were brought up in government where we had to try to have functional control over a wide set of things, but we, weren't, we didn't have full control over anything. When you, when you can shed all of that functional control and focus on getting full control of one thing, you're unstoppable. There's lots of people out there that can kind of like multitask and have yeah. functioning control over 10 different things, but the one guy, the one gal, who has full control over the one thing? Oh man, can't be stopped. Perfect. Mm. So well said. Yeah, multitasking is bullshit. Can't happen. <sighs> just can't do it because just never get back to the thing that you're supposed to be doing. You know, and um, I just, I just think you're opening people's eyes to that, to the ability to do that, and to think about what they can, not only what they can learn, but what they can do. And think about being, you guys are, are independent thinkers. That's what you do. You question things, but with background, yep. that's significant. We don't agree with your questions. We don't agree with your point of view sometimes, but you still run a platform yep. where we can basically sit here and make fun of Julian's tin hat. Right. <laughs> exactly. Right? Right. And you can sit here point. and tell me all day long that I'm lying to you about not being exactly. current CIA. Yep. That's, yep. that's the kind of thing that that's right. doesn't get to exist. In and the other people channels. that bitch and moan. What we're talking about, the people that are complaining all the time, this didn't happen, whatever. There are people that don't have that independent, yep. independent thought. So what is their what is their one thing? Bitching and moaning. Bitching and moaning. That's what so they do. At it. And they're great at it. <laughs> and it's it's instant gratitude. It's instant satisfaction. Yeah. Oh, did you see what I said? And that dude said, okay, yeah. but what what did you accomplish by having that instant you know gratification? Nothing. Yeah. Nothing. Think, You're back in the circle. So think about back it. This, I find this fascinating because because I love watching your guys' podcast continue to grow. And congratulations on both of you. Oh, it's awesome. Continuing to grow. Yeah, we, oh, that's one fantastic. of my favorite things to do is to look at the comments on one of your recent videos. The last, whatever, a video from, <laughs> from two weeks ago. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I know you're laughing. Oh, Julie. yeah. They're great. When I look at it, I look at it just to see how many people are making con comments. Because that's, that's an indicator of engagement. Mm -hmm. And then after I see how many people, I'll open up and just kind of scroll through it to see how many are positive comments and how many are negative comments. The vast majority of these negative comments. Yes. Right? Yes. Trash talking the guest, trash talking the host, trash talking mm -hmm. whatever else. What I think is awesome is that you guys see those comments the same way I do. People are feeding the algorithm mm -hmm. to make YouTube realize that your interview that you just did is interesting to people. Oh, it's great. So then yeah, as, they're, as they're pissing all over us, they don't mm -hmm. even realize they're adding fuel to the vehicle to make it reach more people. 80-20 rule applies. The more people it reaches, 20% of those people are the mm -hmm. right people. 80% of those people are going to piss and moan about it. Make a comment. Fire it up. Get it to more. Generate it to the next level. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I love it. And I love the fact that that's that's going to happen. It's going to happen with this one too. There's probably somebody writing a negative comment right now. <laughs> oh, they've already been there, my oh, friend. Yeah. That and, started at like timestamp like, oh, two. shit. How do I delete that thing? <laughs> I don't right. want this to go to anybody. They don't realize uh, that they just shut their mouth. If all the naysayers just shut their mouth, no, social don't media do that. would come to do a that. screeching halt. Isn't that interesting that you'll click on a YouTube video just so you can scroll right past the video and read the comments? If you take mm -hmm. a look, if you take a look at my Twitter account, I'm pretty sure my Twitter account is, is Oh, it's World War Five. It's full yeah. of hate yeah. followers. <laughs> yeah. Really? Yeah. No, no one have likes you, heard, you. Have you heard of, <laughs> have you heard of hate following? I love hate following. People follow you just because they hate you. They hate they follow you so that yeah. they can be the first yes. one to shit talk you they as soon as you make a tweet. Yeah. Mm. yeah. 
it's, no, the, your your comments are both of your comments yeah. are pretty crazy. Yeah, your comments are fucking <laughs> yeah, hilarious, and I love it because every I'll, I'll refresh my feed, and every other comment is this guy wasn't a real CIA spy, or yep. like this guy's oh, taking over they, the world. Like, I love when they correct, but it's, you know, like, that couldn't have happened because stop. all right, bro, whatever. Stop. Yeah, and whatever. it's so easy to predict too, because yeah. then you, if I have John Karyaku on here, everyone's fucking kissing his toes. Yep. yep. They mm-hmm. love John Karyaku. It's mm-hmm. the it's that's the way that fucking the people on the internet confirmation think. bias. Yeah, yes. exactly right. Confirmation but it, bias. But it's a want. great vehicle. I mean, it's it's fabulous. Truly, no, it's, it's truly fantastic. It's but we're right now we're talking about the easiest thing that we shouldn't be taken for granted, which is like you know the ability to communicate and how it's changing on like a mass level. Great, very important. I I agree. I want to continue to see it like go this route of where we're seeing a lot of good independent thought out there, but in society itself and i mean this around the world you know i just get the feeling all the time as as a naturally positive guy you still have to be a realist about what's going on and i've never felt things so fragile Mm. and it's like when you look at history effectively the world got fragile the minute you know we dropped two i don't know why we need to do two nukes on japan but that's another question but like you drop a couple nuclear bombs you prove that it's possible and then you know what a lot of people don't even realize is that within the next 10 years, a lot of countries, including us, were able to develop chemical weapons, all these different things. And I look at this and I go, holy shit, we have had this stuff for now 75 years, whatever it is. Mm-hmm. And for the most part, like we've been OK on like a mass killing perspective in, in that way. Right. But now we're living in this world where every day I'm like, when someone just like going to drop the microwave bomb and we just all go <laughs> And, right. you know, this whole conversation about independent journalism doesn't exist because we don't anymore. Mm. Where are the aliens? That's my question. I don't know. Let's mm. just end it with that. Rings of Saturn. <laughs> mm. You know, it's funny you said one of the uh, the guy who I was telling you about, the Harvard guy, was was also telling me about this technology the Air Force has that is some sort of laser beam hologram technology. And its purpose is designed to show up on fighter on radar of an enemy's radar and show up like a fleet yeah. of planes or shit is coming at you when really it's just fucking holograms. Yeah. yeah. And it, the first thing I thought about yeah. was the UFO sightings off those yep. ships. And yeah, buddy. That's not just technology we have. That's technology. That That is... They're exists. basically laser pointers in the sky. And that's exactly how those fighter j- pilots explain and describe it's, them. It's asymmetrical warfare. That's all it is. If you can make a radar system detect something, then you've got an asymmetric advantage. You can turn one fighter jet in the sky into 15 fighter jets in the sky. Mm. You can turn zero fighter jets in the sky into a fleet of fighter jets in the sky. You can make it look like an unidentified flying object off the coast of your carrier suddenly ducked into the ocean, ducked out of the ocean, and then flew straight up into the atmosphere. You can essentially incapacitate any radar-driven device with disinformation. Yeah, is that what you think this is? Uh, after we talked about this, maybe almost a year ago now. Yeah, would you have you has your opinion changed on it since then? No, I mean, if, if anything, with the increased amount of research and the increased amount of information that's come out since the government started releasing its UAP and UFO, you know, uh, reports, it the overwhelming probability continues to point to terrestrial explanations. Mm-hmm. Right. Mm. Whether it's whether it's new weapon systems, old weapon systems, experimental weapon systems, disinformation systems, whatever it is, that is still the predominant description. There's Mm. fantastic, uh, fantastic reporting out there that explains the the tick tock, the tic tacs that we're seeing. I mean, very sound, solid scientific explanations for how it's shadow from radar, uh, how it's the it's the, the speeds that are reported are inaccurate compared to the actual speeds that are reported on the actual um, uh, airframes themselves that can that help to color with more scientific context what those various UFOs were recorded by the Navy fighter jet pilots, which also explains why they would be publicly allowed to be released. Because they're they're not, in fact, hyper dangerous weapon systems from foreign governments, and they're not, in fact, suspicious foreign invaders. Right. Mm. So, yeah, I, as far as the whole UFO con, uh, conversation goes, I still very much believe we have to lean on terrestrial explanations first. When those are proven to be unreliable, then we can open the door mm. to what's next. But mm-hmm. we have to we have to start with what we know. That's what science is. You mm-hmm. start with what you know. Mm-hmm. Well, then how do you explain how do you rationalize the the New York Times articles coming out saying that we have to take these seriously as a as a 
otherworldly threat. I don't know if if the New York Times is coming out saying we have to take them seriously as an otherworldly threat, mm -hmm. then whoever like that, literally the word threat they use. I'm sure. But otherworldly is the thing that I don't necessarily mm -hmm. believe. Right. Do we have to take them as a serious threat? Yes. If you have some sort of phenomenon happening in the atmosphere that puts commercial airlines in danger or puts military aircraft in danger. Yes, that's a threat that you have to take seriously. But do you have to take it seriously as an otherworldly alien species threat? No. But that, and I think the government is doing the right thing, answering to the American public and answering to mm. general flight safety and uh, air superiority. If if you want to control the skies above a battlefield, you have to understand what's happening in the skies. above. that's why special operations have special ops meteorologists, mm. because you've got to be able to control the sky. Yep. If there are pockets of gas and weird lights and, and objects in the sky that could put a pilot at risk or put a drone in danger, we've got to understand what it is. Yep. Is there a protocol for if a spaceship lands on the White House lawn? Is there, is there, is there a somebody government got, protocol? Somebody got paid for that. Had to happen. Yeah. Someone in Deloitte. No doubt. Yeah. Sleepy Joe wasn't aware. What would that <laughs> protocol be? I don't know what it would be, but I was thinking, let me go back to your the last bit of conversation. So if you think about TWA 800, now we interviewed- I was most, just going to bring that up. I love where your head's we, at. What we, is what is We what is interviewed, that? so TWA 800 sometime in 95, I think it was July of, ni of 95, um, there's a commercial airliner coming out of LaGuardia Airport, heading to France, packed. It's like a, it's a, it's a uh, 747 mm -hmm. packed. Um, there's probably 300, 280, 300 passengers on it. And it shot, it, well, I won't say it shots down. It, it, <laughs> it blows up in midair about 13 miles off of the airport. And, you know, everyone obviously dies. This splits the, in half. This the, like the soccer, or is there students or something? Students, that's yeah. right. It was students going over to like uh, some type of summer Summer Youth Week in France. Yeah. So. Um, and you worked this case. You were investigating this. So we put this thing back together over the course of a year. And there's clearly a missile shot in the side of it. The explanation that the center gas tanks on the 747 were not locked off. So they're supposed to be locked off so they can't pass wing to wing. They can only take the fuel that they have in either wing. And the pilot can go ahead and, you know, switch out. So the explanation was, well, there was a little bit of a seal that was not working, and it opened up, and the thing blew up in the sky. We, I think we interviewed every, every certified 747 pilot in, in the United States who all said that that's impossible, that mm -hmm. that could have happened. Take it forward. There was a Navy ship in the area that there was a, a rocket or a missile that was seen traveling to the aircraft, uh, a bunch of flames, and then... Basically, the thing dropped right after that. Let's take the technology that we just talked about. Mm -hmm. This particular person or persons that were commanded that ship swore that they saw enemy aircraft in the air. And that's mm -hmm. why they made the shot. Now, that's gone. You can't find that anywhere. Just like the, I hate to say this, but just like some transmissions with a couple of fighter pilots right at as 9-11 was happening, who supposedly may have caught up to the Shanksville aircraft. I don't know that to be a fact, but you can't find anything on that anymore, but it was out there. The transmissions and everything. Yeah, fact, I those, heard about that. In fact, those guys interviewed on Nightline, the yeah. two pilots. So Ted Koppel interviewed them. Here comes the comments. And then it's gone. Right. So, but take, but take that TW-800, think about what we were just talking about with things in the sky to make it look like as if there's a fleet of fighter jets, you know, rolling across um, from from another country, take the Navy ship in the area, take the witness accounts, eyewitness accounts, including I think Pierre Salinger was one of the ones that actually reported on it. Who knows, right? I mean, yeah, here we go. Conspiracy theory. Right. So, yeah, because I wonder if that was... Let the skepticism begin. The reason I was going to ask about that... Right, is, though, makes sense, right? It doesn't. Could and be. Then it, and then it, what does make sense is that they had to stop, you know, going back to like the, the TWA 800, though, like what does make sense is that you can't admit that, right? Oh, so, yeah. so all right, just straight up without going into all the conflicting details with this and everything. It's like you're a Navy ship. You fire off test missiles. 
or you're off the coast of Long Island, and if you see enemy aircraft, you're supposed to fire because you get one shot to do it. You end up firing on a commercial airliner. We all know what kind of hearings would happen in D.C., the regulation and what you wouldn't be allowed to do anymore. And so from a cost-effective perspective, which is a very callous way of putting it, there's no reason to say that the military, the Navy, whatever, wouldn't make an assessment there in coordination with the top levels of government to say, look, uh, win some, lose some. This right. is an L. Public can't really know about this, and we're going to move the fuck on. And then they shut down your investigation. And again, that's a tough one because if there's no malice with it, which I guess we'll never know, but I have no reason to believe, like, why would you shoot down a bunch of students going to fucking mm. France? You right. know what I mean? Like, yeah, there, right. there's no malice there. No. Absolutely then, not. then the bigger picture of like that's just me right. think, thinking out loud about kind of tying together, right? Right. You know, as we as we do so well, you yeah. See in the bureau, we we connect dots now. Mm. Yeah. Together. Have you ever seen the documentary? What was the doc- the documentary I told you to watch about nine eleven? Yeah, it was like four hours. It was nine yeah. eleven, the new Pearl Harbor. It was a four hour documentary. They take they take. I'm a sure lot a of, lot of it is bullshit. Yeah, but they go deep yeah. on it. Like they they interviewed. I think it was like. 400 Boeing pilots and and Boeing engineers. This is just one of the things they had in there that stuck out with me the most. They said that those Boeing jets could not fly at that speed, at that low of an altitude without the wings ripping off. Mm. I got a theory on this. What's your theory? Call it the Julian Dory. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm just fucking with you. No, but like looking at the, the 9-11 thing, because you were there that day. You're another person there that, that can speak to this. Mm-hmm. I find that people who were below the age of at least six or seven, sometimes a little older on that day, and or, and perhaps more importantly, people who lived starting two states out, or call it 150 miles in radius from New York City, are increasingly exponentially more likely to assume conspiracies at the highest level on all of that because they did not know people who were there that day in the building who went down with the building or were on the ground or one of each. Mm. And so when you're someone like me or especially someone like you who was A, just past that age, old enough to be able to understand what was going on, B, knew people that died in there, C, knew people on the ground, D, knew people that got out of the building and what they reported, it is very hard to listen to some of the arguments that people try to make about how this was all a fucking inside job when they take liberties with what actually happened that day and what people reported when they were going through the building. And then they also switch around facts. Now, are there things that were there mistakes made? Oh, fuck yeah. We already talked about it. We know the CIA and FBI had a lot of issues going back and forth. Furthermore, could there have been a couple rogue people in the government that maybe had intelligence and were like, ah, oh, this wouldn't be the worst thing ever? Sure. And mm. would the government ever let the public know that? Absolutely fucking not. And of course, we want to know that, but they're not going to do that. But what people do is they then take it down to George Tenet was literally standing there controlling a missile that looked like a plane because it was graphically edited to do that and put it into the fucking Twin Towers and we went over there to kill a million Iraqis. And that's, that's where I go, hold on a fucking minute, take a step back. That that's that's not what this was. What people don't want to look at with the conspiracy of like 9-11 is the very real possibility that a bad thing could happen. Bad people in the government might have been like a human being that day, upset it did, who then also then took advantage of every fucking thing that it allowed them to do to be able to take other powers that perhaps liberties that they didn't have the power to take in the past and set all these precedents that get us to this point where you had this world changing event that changed everything, changed our way of life and has now gotten us to a point in the country where 20 years later, more than 20 years later, we're literally more divided than ever. And people are looking for a search for meaning. So they find it in two towers going down that day and a fucking Pentagon hit. Mm. I don't know why on the internet that's a controversial opinion but apparently it is and like when i watch a documentary like that which i do i actually want to watch it again you know they can tie together some things that make sense but then they'll to go back to the conspiracy point they'll tie nine things together that make no fucking sense absolutely none absolutely and then when you have the pro- another problem is when you have things declassified like operation northwoods that's not mm-hmm. a very good look either. Yeah. Yeah, you're right. And there's tons of questions. I mean, there is tons of questions. There's tons of things that were never answered, tons of things that were hidden, like all the tapes that were hidden. You know, I guess there's. Can you tell people what that was? Just that they, they're the, aware. Northwoods. Oh, Operation Northwoods. Yeah. 
um, was a declassified operation that was planned by, I believe, Alan Dulles, who is the head of the CIA, to fly a empty um, airliner, a passenger airliner over Cuba and shoot it down and then claim that Cuba shot it down mm. to create a false flag and to invade Cuba. Um, that's pretty terrifying when, mm. to, to, when you read through it. Um, they didn't like Cuba, man. Fuck. Yeah. That was during the whole Kennedy thing. Yeah. And Kennedy is the they one. Like Kennedy was either. the one who shot that no. down, right? Or who ended that? Oh, here we go. We got the fucking. Oh, there we go. Route. 13 March 62. You write this, Jim? <laughs> I was, uh, it was my first uh, document. <laughs> so, so just so, you know, random admin geek insight. So if you look at the classification at the top, mm -hmm. oh, you know, please zoom back out. Zoom out a little, little too top much. Secret. Yeah. There you go. Top special secret, handling. special handling, no foreign. That. What does that mean? That was very, very classified back then. TSSH. Mm. Right. That top secret is by itself. It means you can only see it if you have a top secret clearance. Special handling is above special compartmented information. It's a subset within special compartmented. So if you have SCI and access to special handling, that's what special handling means. So if there are 10,000 people with, with a top secret clearance, there might be a thousand with SCI. There might mm. be a hundred with special handling. Mm. And then the no foreign, it means no foreigner is allowed to see this. Oh, wow. And that's specific because it means this cannot be seen by any American allies. No Canadians, no mm -hmm. Australians, mm. no New Zealanders, no Brits. So that's what the no foreign means. So this was very, very classified if that was the original classification. Fuck. Yeah. So it's pretty. And it's still, I mean, not many people know about it. Mm. Really, no. not many people know about it. No. There's a small, like you said, the 80 20 rule. There's really not many people who nope. pay attention to this shit. Yeah. Can you scroll down? Scroll down to you'll see on the lower left hand corner of the report. It might be right here. Stop right there. Do no, keep going down. Yeah, I'm looking for. Stop there a second. Nope, go back up. Top secret. How do we get this? Sixty nine three. Who leaked this? I don't know. That's a good question. It's not a leak. If it's unclassified, yeah, it's, it's unclassified. Not they released. Oh, it. they it did. was probably taken to a reading room. Yeah. Yeah. NSA archive too. Now, how do we get all this stuff on on fucking Kennedy's assassination? There's you, a reason that was extended. Classified. Yeah, that was extended. What? There's a reason. Oh wait, uh, no, that's what I does that know say? Twenty one. What would happen? Reviewed by a JCS right, on so May of twenty one. Right. If you were like, we all want to know. We all want to see the classification document continued. On, on yeah. JCS, there it is. Right? It's yep. So continued after eighty eighty four. Huh. Yep. Let, let, let him. Yeah. Let the word go forth. <laughs> this document does not have the proper markings, Eric. What were you saying, Julian? <laughs> I'm saying we if if we all wanted to like not have any consequences for anything and like just kind of like no, we'd all love to see the JFK document. Yeah, oh, yeah, obviously. But like we there was a second shooter on the on the grassy knoll. No doubt. There's a 99.9 actually 100,000% chance that that person was traceable to individuals in four different layers, three different layers, two different layers, one layer in a fucking mobster mm -hmm. removed from individuals at the CIA. And so even if it were rogue elements there, if you release that document 60 years later tomorrow, and it says that, the trust in the CIA is gone forever. It doesn't matter if 60 years ago, it's like, oh my God, you guys whacked the president. But there's no treat. What Andy's saying is there it doesn't matter if there's trust or not. What would happen? What would be the implications on society if we all found out? They said, okay, yep, we plotted to kill Kennedy. We whacked him. I could like think what of, would happen? I could think of How many people would even pay uh -huh. attention to it? All, all you need is that 0.01% chance you didn't, that, that seed of doubt over there yeah. that allows Plausible it to continue. Deniability. Yes. Yeah. That's the problem. It's, it's, so I want to, I want to make sure that I highlight Julian, that your whole, you've slipped in this rogue element thing, like rogue officer, rogue element, right? It, it's not, it's kind of like from uh, princess bride. I don't think it means what you think it means. <laughs> right. I, we've talked about Harlan's Razor, right? No. Never subscribe to conspiracy. What can be explained with idiocy? Oh, that's what that is? Okay. Never subscribe yeah. to conspiracy. What can be explained with idiocy? It's much more realistic that somebody just had to go poop and they didn't read that report on that could have saved 9-11. It's much more likely that that person was just feeling sleepy and went to go get a cup of coffee mm -hmm. Ended up in a long conversation, came back up and forgot which document he was reading. And just did the crossword puzzle and went home. Much more likely that happened Incompetent. than some mm -hmm. rogue, rogue officer saw this piece of killer bulletproof evidence and said, I'm just going to let this pass and let them all burn. 
Right? right? The thing is nobody, you want to know what people are really uncomfortable with the idea of? Incompetency in the government. Yes. That's what yes. they're so yep. uncomfortable with that that they'd rather believe the government is so intelligent that they can keep a conspiracy. Right. Then why did all those people true. why did all those people in government politicians sell off all of their American Airlines stocks? Two weeks before. It's the same thing mm. that happened here with the guy who said, I'm going to die in the Bahamas. If it's not going to be suicide, it's the FBI. Maybe. It's the CIA suiciding yeah. me. <laughs> right. They've Our, done that before, though. No. Yeah. There's always you've always got to be ready to consider correlation versus causation. Mm -hmm. And that's a fair point. And again, it goes back to something else that we were saying earlier, which is that when you use that logic, though, you can always say it falls on the side of, of correlation or a, a coincidence or whatever because mm -hmm. you're already saying that 99% of the time that's what it is so this isn't the 1% and that's where you know look I'm some fucking guy in an armchair like I, I don't I'm not sitting there looking through government documents down in Langley you know so I can only know what I know and I also like I get pissed off when everyone says every goddamn thing is a conspiracy it's like no it's mm -hmm. not but then where do you throw them a bone and say well yeah this this one was we'll give them Epstein yeah uh, hey, even then him. even then right like Epstein is proof of criminal activity, not proof of high level government conspiracy, right? Mm -hmm. It's still not smoke and gun. You know what is smoke and gun? Criminal activity, mm -hmm. not high level government conspiracy. I mean, conspiracy. we did find OJ innocent in this country, so I guess smoke <laughs> yeah. and gun is real yeah. fucking subjective. No, definitely. What kind of country? You don't, do you, hey you guys, don't think Epstein's smoking gun? What kind gun? of country do you want to live in? Do you want to live in a government? Do you want to live in a country where you go to jail? only with a smoking gun? Or do you want to go to jail in a country that says, eh, there's like a 15% chance that I'm right, so send them off just to be safe. Just to be safe, that person should yeah. go to jail. Yeah, mm. that's a fair. Right? So all those, it's it's just one of those things. So what was Epstein? Epstein was, is a still a big question mark in a lot of world, in a lot of places. There's information we're not allowed to see. There's information that nobody has. There's tons of criminal activity. But you know what? Like Tons. When you have professional politicians... Mm -hmm. That lends itself towards criminal activity. Mm. When you when you have a, a system where the same politicians that dictate the law <laughs> are the politicians who are elected to make the law, and then what law what laws do they have to follow? Right? It's you've got All right. super PACs out there or funding who the politician's gonna be. You've got lobbyists out there deciding who's gonna be it's it's not a government by the people for the people like it was intended to be. And even then, it was never intended to be a government for the people by the people. It was a government intended to be for land owning individuals by land owning individuals. Oh yeah, we had to change that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't know if we ever actually changed it either. Right? Well we took are you talking about like how we were still like a like a slave driven society? My, yeah. My point is our country was founded, our entire government was founded on yep. the idea that you don't get a say unless you own land. Which mm -hmm. is a way of saying you don't get a say unless you have a stake in the long-term success of the country. Now we are a country where you can have a say and you can be wholly against the government itself and you still have an equal say mm -hmm. to somebody who has a business, has land, has multiple kids, has whatever else, right? I'm not saying it's right or wrong. I'm just saying, let's notice where we were, where we are, right? And, and where we're going. Yeah. Ideally, where are we going? Their, right, let's, let's, their for, vote's as good as anybody else. For a second, let's, let's play, let's play a, a realistic, not realistic, like something that definitely has happened as far as like where intelligence has been used through criminal enterprises to be able to get information and let's remove like Epstein from the equation. Let's say that you are government A. This could be any power, pick any powerful government in the world, US, Russia, China, France, Britain, Israel, Israel, pick any one of them. And you are sitting in a room. Let's say you're sitting in a room in the mid sixties right now. And you are saying to yourself, okay, we are focused on the survival of our country, not 10 years from now, not 50 years from now, but a thousand years from now. Okay. And that could also include, you know, the every country I just named is an ethnicity too. So let's mm -hmm. even include that with perhaps with the exception of America in a way, obviously. But like they're looking for the survival of their people to be able to have a place in the world and not be threatened in the future. And you have in this room the president or prime minister, the fucking head of the intelligence, the head of the national police, and maybe one or two other people. It is the top guns on a need-to-know basis. And you say to yourself, okay, 
what's the best way for us to be able to survive? Well, it's to have leverage. It's to have a need so that other people who aren't like us from other places have to help us out when we call upon them. I think this is going to go a lot better if you don't answer your own questions. I'm not, I'm not answering. You just answered your own question. How do I just answer Because you just said, question? what are they going to think? They're going to think, we need to do this, this way, this, that's what you just did. Yeah, but, but, I'm, sa- but I'm saying, like, mm. think about it in the, in the worst, like, actually put the visual on it. Okay. And you're saying, what if, what if we needed to get leverage over these people to be able to do what we need to do? So and right away, you're assuming that the best solution is to get leverage over the people. It's, and you're know telling their me darkest it's not? secrets. Yeah. You're telling me it's not? Nope. Nope. The, how, okay. do, how do you Explain. how do you ensure the survival of a country for a thousand years? A I mean, bunch of different, yeah, bunch of different. You don't try to deals. leverage the people. Yeah. You take the choice away from the people. Yes, by leveraging them. But how do you take? Why them? is China buying up every single fucking port around the world because they just enjoy collecting ports? They're they're not leveraging, they're not leveraging people. They're literally just rewriting the rules. That's not leverage. That's not leverage means it takes effort to try to put your leverage is another way of saying debt. It means you. How's that not debt? That's literally debt. You, I go buy Greece's fucking port for six hundred billion dollars or six hundred million, whatever it was. Yeah. And now Greeks owe me shit. How's that not leverage? So because China's not leveraging China. Greek is le- the Greek in that example. Greece is leveraged. Yes, this is OK. So let's right. go right back to it. This is exactly what I'm saying. So you are these people in a room from country A and you are saying I'm focused on our survival. Uh-huh. And the only way to do that is to get leverage off of all pick out all these powerful nations and the people who are in them who mean something and have a say. Would you not sit there if you're just thinking in this way? And I'm actually trying to look at it from their perspective of like they're not. They're not being evil, but they can lead themselves to think and do an evil thing that's past the line. Would you not sit there? Would you not be able to see them sitting there in that time and in this group think room of five people focused on this one thing, be able to convince themselves like, you know what? Yeah, we would sacrifice 50,000 girls over the next four or five decades to make sure we were able to do that. Because what's the one thing no one can come back from? Fucking a kid. It's the one thing you can't come back from. OJ Simpson's out there tweeting and he fucking hacked his wife to death. Now, I would argue he didn't really come back, but there's other people who have come back from horrible things. You can't, once you, once you are a kid fucker, you're a kid fucker. You've it's never, done. Yeah, you, you're, you haven't traveled to Pakistan, India, the Philippines, Thailand. I'm talking about in, in, in the, in the power, in the power What do you mean? What do you mean when you say world. that? Those, I mean, child prostitution is a very real thing all over yeah. the world. Yes, I know that. I'm saying in and the United States, people, it's not well, accepted you in public, though. You didn't say anything about it being an American. You said a powerful country, and then you listed off a whole bunch of different examples. Britain, United States, yeah, yeah, yeah. France. Like, there's plenty of powerful countries out there where it's a totally normal thing. It's not newsworthy at all. And let's not forget that, let's not glorify hmm. the United States where we have a massive human trafficking of children problem. Right. But, Right. So there's plenty of ways that you can bounce back just fine all over the world. Like it's not like a death sentence to engage in prostitution or child prostitution. Yeah, but not with it's people just, who make laws, not with yeah. people who make the rules. Yes. Those are exactly the, the people who make the rules are the people who have the most power. Again, if you're I think the problem here is you're actually trying to veiledly talk about the United States by no, using no, this no, 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 by using not. this hypothetical country. I was not. No. So, so then if you're talking about a hypothetical country, we can talk about real countries where it yes. happens all the time including the United States. Right, but if you're a country who has bigger threats so that your threats are the th- other three big countries that are much bigger than you, have much more powerful people that could easily take you over or easily destroy your race or your culture or whatever it is, you want to have leverage on the tippy top people of those top countries, okay. those top nations. So you're right? going to try to blackmail them with child prostitution. That's yes. what you're saying. Okay, got it. Yeah, I mean leverage. Hey, leverage is in power, right? So we're we're mutually assured destruction still exists. You know what I mean? The fact that Putin's in power and he's got nuclear weapons. The fact that North Korea has nuclear weapons. The fact that Pakistan has nuclear weapons. That's that's really where the leverage Bingo. lies on each other. Nobody yep. wants to die, right? We don't want to be extinct. So as a population. Don't... Now, the rest of what you're talking about with with child labor and child slavery and those issues are very are very real. Mm-hmm. Um, however, I've been to Thailand. I know Andy has. I've been to certain places where it's the accepted way of culture. Mm-hmm. Not for us. We get picked up immediately by 
people that watch out for that to happen to us. Not that we would select to do it, right. but make sure that they're not selecting us. Yes. Kind of thing. Right. Yes. So um when I when I think about leverage on top people, it's never gonna happen. Efficiently, efficiently, you're not gonna go down the road of blackmail. Blackmail is an mm. unpredictable one, one swing, one attempt to blackmail somebody. If it works, it might work for a short period of time. But it's much more it's much more controllable to gain leverage over somebody with a strong deterrent. Yep. So if I had Would if, you say it worked with Epstein? Well Well, we can't know the if, full if, extent, if you but say, say if, yes. if if you would say the theory is true, would you say it was a would you say it was effective? All I'm saying is if the news were able to come out that that pick any of the last five presidents, like like any of them. Yeah. If the news were ever able that's the highest level. If the news ever came out while they held any power, so let's say while they were in office that there was irrefutable evidence that they were fucking a kid. And no, I'm not ta- talking about Monica Lewinsky because she was fucking 21 years old. I'm saying, like, dead seriously. If it came out, they're like, oh, they're fucking 14-year-olds. They're done. They're done. Agreed. Benito. Yeah. Agreed. But what, I think what we're saying is knowing... That's not going to put another country in power over the United States. Yeah. And, why not? And it's just never going to happen. Yeah. But that's never going to happen. Why? It's, I, so because what, because the United States is bigger than a us. president, and we're nobodies. It wouldn't yeah. happen to us. We've traveled to the country. But I can who, tell you the 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 in brief is I'm going to be on your ass, and I'm going to make sure nobody approaches you because you go to wash your hands. I was undercover in Thailand. You, you go to wash your hands, and there's a girl sitting on the faucet. You got to like wash move her out of the like way. This. Yeah. Yeah. So. Um, it's just the accepted way of, of you're trying, their yeah, culture. You're, you're trying to Terrible, ask us to prove to you in a conversation why an unlikely situation isn't likely going to happen and why even if it did happen, it wouldn't create enough leverage to unseat an, a nation state or to put one country over another country. It just, like, that's an impossible task that you're asking for in the first place. If you just think through it logically, a... a how many how many controversies have happened of any kind all over the world where the country remains even though the head of state's replaced? Mm. Oh yeah, yeah, but it's but, not. But if the head of state and the blackmailer are the two people in possession of this knowledge and no one else knows, and then the head of state in head their of state own, for sure is going to call the bluff. They're going to say blackmailer, do it. I dare you, and you better do it faster than I can use my executive authorities to have you assassinated. Mm. So if I have video of that dude, deep fake, you prove to me it's not a deep fake. All right, in two thousand, how could it be a deep fake? Prove to me that it was from two thousand. Right. No, 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 no. I'm, I'm saying like, let's say no. Let's I'm literally you, go back twenty years ago. Who's, not in twenty twenty two. Who's got the burden of evidence? How, yeah, you could easily make a video look like it was shot ten years ago. Correct. Even no, if you, no. I'm saying so. Like, let's go ago. back right now. Do you see and what say this happened, Julian? Do you see what you're doing? Oh, oh, oh. You are now. You are now artificially creating the confines of the exercise to tighten he was it up in to existence. a place because you're looking for something specific. You're not having a hypothetical conversation. You're digging for some kind of specific parallel. Or you're not having a true I think the leverage, I think you, you just can't, I, yeah. I know where you're coming from and I get it, but the leverage just isn't in that it, particular piece. Deterrent is everything. Just blackmail, knowing. Blackmail it, is the weakest, the you, weakest leverage in the world. You can come out and just say, okay, you know, an admission, you know, just come out. Listen, I, I made a mistake. I didn't know she you was know, 14. Yeah, how I had many no judges, idea. How and many then, judges have we had yeah. say that? And you have a million people come behind you and say, he really didn't. He's really in care. He's, it goes away. Right. But in, when you fight it, that's when it becomes leverage. When you when you continue to say, what are you going to do? Like, you know, take. I mean, take it to another level. The person I was just, I don't know if I was telling you guys, one of, one of somebody I know, you know, had an instance where with uh, gift cards, you know, hey, I'll fix your computer. Mm. If in fact, you just go out and buy me $5,000 worth of Sephora gift cards the end of the day, you know, as, as long as you come clean at that point and say, oh, my God, you know, I had no idea what was going on, whatever, it goes away okay. on a different level. You know, and it's the same thing. Hey, I know you're saying this, but he uh, he didn't do, you know, he didn't know, he didn't do it, prove it, whatever. I know it's just not goes com- away. I know Couldn't it's not comforting. Know, so you're seeing it's it, not a deter- no, at least you, you're, you're taking, you're not playing – word jujitsu with what I said. You are taking, then that's exactly why I brought it up. You're taking what I said and you're extrapolating it into these very real hypothetical situations. Yeah. And I can accept that because that's, and that's why I'm asking it. Cause it's like, would this have that type of power? Yep. And you're saying 
hypothetically in a lot of situations, not necessarily. Correct. Okay. Right. But couldn't it That's be useful on a smaller yeah. scale? And couldn't it be used for influence? Like just say, okay, Clinton. To a certain point. Clinton knows he was in your house fucking getting a massage and a rub and tug from a 14 year old. I think I'm not going to say it. I'm not going to bring it up. But next time I ask you a, for a favor, you're going to know subconsciously that that exists for a certain. So it has a shelf life, right? Because right. eventually you're going to come to the per people that you trust and say, look, I might've got jammed up. Yep. I might've exactly done something right. stupid and then it goes away. Yeah. Right. Mm, but right. there's a moment of, of uncomfortableness. It's like anything, any of our relationships, something happens. You know what? I screwed up. The other thing okay, gotta, it goes away. There's the, nothing you could say after that. The biggest know? reason why this blackmail has a shelf life is because the person who becomes the blackmailer at some point in time, if they choose to execute that card, now they have to publicly explain why they held that secret for so mm. long. That's the shelf life. But here, yeah. So I guess my point is they don't want to publicly bring, they don't want to publicly use that card. They just want to keep it as unconscious leverage. For Correct. A, for yeah. a shelf life. And they better be perfect. Yep. In their world. Because deterrent, what we're talking about, mutually assured destruction. Yep. I can guarantee you, you give me a couple of days, we'll I'll find, find I'll dirty. find your piece. Mm. And then now we're, and that's a lot of times that's what may happen that we don't see behind the scenes with a guy like Epstein. So Correct. when you, when you, you know turn, what I mean? Like what did, what did we kind of show him that might have been, well, we know what we showed him, showed him a noose, you know, I mean, mm -hmm. basically, but, um, well, I'm not saying that anyone did it. I'm just saying that's kind of what happened. You know, Where that were you that night, Jim? Yeah. There was what, was, uh, what was Epstein, what was Ghislaine, Ghislaine's, her dad, what was the story with her dad again? Well, the, her dad is, is. Did she he, hold he the black was book? A, he was Did she a have the book? Asset, I think so. Yeah, she had the book, right? He was a Mossad asset. And he was the and biggest, he was the biggest like media guy in where? Where was, where was he? He was like. The, in Britain. In Britain, and right, it was right. all a house of cards too. He actually left a giant fraud for his kids when mm. he died. Right, he was like the Rupert Murdoch of Britain. Yeah, but even look at client number nine. Right, that guy's lived. Was it? What was it? Elliot Elliot Spitzer was that his name? The yeah. mayor or the governor of New York? I mean, that goes away. He's he's thriving, and, and the woman is thriving. Hooker? Yeah, Ashley Dupree. She's thriving. She she lives down at the Jersey Shore. She owns her own is. stores and. Hangs out, married like top money, you know. She was one of the victims, right? No, she was the hooker. Oh, <laughs> she was she was the one client number nine. Was she made girl. money and took him down. Oh, yeah. Oh wow. Yeah. Look what happened to uh, what's the what's the prince's name that did the interview? The fucking interview. No, prince, <laughs> Andrew. <laughs> prince Andrew. Prince Andrew. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. Oh, the my. forgotten prince. Oh uh, yeah. I don't think he's like the brightest bulb. No. I don't think yeah. there's a no. ton going on up there. Mm -mm. Might have been some of that, like, yeah. royal ancestral. They told him he was a prince. He came out in purple. <laughs> like, no, you're not that prince, bro. You're not that kind of prince. You're yeah. actually a Velvet. prince. Oh, all right. Sorry. All right, we guys. Motorcycle? That was three and a half hours. It was three and a half hours? Andy, I don't want to make you late. I appreciate you, brother. Yeah. Thank you guys so much. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Both of you guys. That was great. Keep up the good work, man. Yeah. We love it. Tell the people listening where they can uh, learn more about what you guys are doing. Yeah, if you want to find me, you'll find me at everydayspy.com. You'll find me on my podcast, the Everyday Espionage Podcast. And if you're on social media, you'll find me everywhere at Everyday Spy. Awesome. J3 Global for me. Um, I just did a new website. Check it out and give me your input. Um, awesome and uh, also on LinkedIn. LinkedIn is really where I, where I shine. So I'll see you on LinkedIn. Look me up. Friend me up. Send me a message. And the Trend of Fire podcast. Soon to be the Julian Dory experience. It's not going to be experience. <laughs> Are you fucking kidding me? <laughs> the on. Julian Dory podcast. Well, well, it's there will be a name change announced early next year, I think. But all linked below, guys. Now it's trend to Don't want to spoil it. Yeah. Sleep tight, everyone. Thanks, guys. <laughs>